It's already five o'clock, so we'll get going. Uh, I officially open the special meeting of Tuesday, the 23rd of March at 5 p.m. Um, Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. We recognise the respect and cultural heritage beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continual importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for, the, for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Uh, members, I don't have any apologies or leave of absence. Um, we have two reports tonight. Uh, oh no, sorry, we have uh, two deputations uh, this evening. The first speaker was Mr. Luigi De Con uh, Constanzo. Uh, Mr. De Constanzo is um, not available to join us tonight. He's um, unwell. And so he has sent us his written deputation and should have a copy of that deputation on your tables. Uh, the second deputation I have tonight is Mr. Greg Grishin. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. He's not, oh, there he is, honey. Hello, Greg. Um, if you'd like to come forward, you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, and if you can press the speak button in front of you, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Become the expert at this, Mayor. Speak. Firstly, may I thank Council for providing the opportunity to allow us to uh, present today on behalf of a raft of businesses and landowners or property owners in and around Flinders Street and extending into Franklin Street. Uh, I, I imagine that some of all of you have had an opportunity to read a somewhat lengthy, perhaps verbose letter from me to the CEO dated the 9th of March, 19th of March 2021. After many years in court, I've learned the lesson that once you put something in writing, the last thing the judge ever wants to hear is you to go back to that in chapter and verse. So I'll Take that as written unless people want to ask me anything about it. Um, essentially, I have a very short period of time, but I thank you for the time that you've allocated there. And I would like to actually perhaps take the, uh, the elected members to the, the detailed uh, credential report of BRM advisory, which it might sound strange that I'm taking to this, because you might think that my initial approach would be to, to find fault with it, but in fact, um, whilst I don't agree with, with parts of it, uh, it is actually a very useful document in setting out what this is really all about and where this is taking us. The first thing that I would ask you to bear strongly in mind is that the project were to go ahead and were to be completed by the completion date of 31 December 2021 is on the basis of what I can read from the uh, credential report likely to be ripped up within two or three years. So we are going to have to revisit this process again. Um, my submission, which is the overwhelming and overriding submission that I make, is this is just not a good project. Um, I am not against the bypass. I am just on behalf of my clients and my fellow uh, property owners and business owners totally opposed to the impact that this particular project would have on Flinders Street. Now, if you go to clause 4.3 very briefly, uh, Mr. Booth, the author of this report, um, makes two very important points at 4.3.2.1. He refers to the disruption caused by project works during construction, limiting access to businesses on the route. We all know that's going to be an absolute horror for those businesses on Flinders Street. Uh, this is post COVID, and I mean, the building, the closest business to me has not reopened. And that I mean, they, they started then they stopped. There are, there are many businesses that are finding life very difficult. Some businesses are flourishing, no doubt, but the majority of businesses have found life very difficult. Um, Flinders Street, with my, with my respectful submission, is the most interesting and vibrant street in the city of Adelaide as of 2021. And the rewards that have been given to those persons who have chosen to invest in Flinders Street have been manifest. You see the words, I see Elias Farah here, 
the work that he did in, in 279 Flinders Street, he turned a really quite mediocre building to something special. There are, I think there's probably in the last three years since we started this process, there would have been, I think, 15 very serious building refurbishments or creations. Flinders Street is a, is a street that is alive. What is the major problem that we have with this is you are going to bring that life to an end. The, the loss of 179 car parks on Flinders Street is catastrophic, and that's at 4.3.2.2. Putting aside the fact that people can't park, therefore they can't come near business, poor Luigi, his business is gone. Um, every cafe is pretty much deleteriously affected. Then you go to some desire that this is to, to look like or be like from from Rome. No one, no one outside of the council that actually put in that brought that bike away thinks it's anything other than a disaster. And yet we keep on getting it put back to us that this is what we want to achieve. Now that's the last thing we want. That's that's as good a project as the one-way freeway that the Lips put in years ago, and which I think the Labor Party actually changed and made it two ways, which was incredibly exciting. Now, I mean, I deal a lot with interstate people, and the two things they laugh at us most about, well, they can't laugh now, but it was that one-way freeway, it's the only one in the world, and the other one is they don't understand Frome Street. We can't turn Flinders Street to Frome Street. Now, if we lose 179 car parks, I'm going to be brutal, because I know that the Mayor is going to be brutal at the time, if we lose 179 car parks, what is the financial effect of that? It is between $500,000 and $786,000. That's revenue, revenue lost. That is revenue that you don't have. And this, this grant, why don't you just let it go? The grant's for half the cost. You don't have $3 million. I mean, I'm in business and a lot of you are in business. You need to borrow that money. It's not as though you've got that money in the bank. You are going to lose between five hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars a year in revenues. You're going to greatly impact upon your rate base or the business operators and, and the owners of those buildings. And and suddenly you're gonna to have to you're gonna to have to keep these premises, keep this road kept up, and you're going to have to, in my view, the report basically says so, you're going to have to do this work again within a limited period of time. Members, this is just members, Mr. Griffin is out of time. Are you happy to allow him a little bit of extra time? Yeah. We never have before. No, no, I just got another 30 seconds I've added on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I should be good. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, my closing submission this is bad business. This is bad. It's bad for the city. It's bad for Flinders Street. It's bad for the financial position of this council. We all want to see this council succeed. We all want to be a part of a healthy, vibrant city. And with great respect, this, hasn't, this doesn't do it. Thank you. I'm going to go through quickly. It does. I want to be able to ramble on for hours. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, now, members, um, we would benefit from discussing some legal advice that was received very late this afternoon, um, but I do uh, wish that this to be seen in confidence or heard in confidence. Um, therefore, I will seek a mover and a seconder to exclude the public just while we uh, receive this legal advice. If I could have a mover, thank you, Councillor Abraham, today. A seconder, thank you, Councillor Donovan. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? Thank you, that's carried. Um, so, members of the public, um, we will ask you if, uh, just to uh, absent yourself from the chamber. Um, it shouldn't take too long, um, but if I could just ask you, um, members of staff, if you're not associated with this item also, if I could ask you to leave the chamber. Um,
I meant to say something. Else. Thank you, uh, members of the gallery of the public. Um, apologies for that. Um, and members, um, I did have one of my <coughs> members from the office of the Lord Mayor here taking some photos, and if you might come back and take a few photos of us while we're in meeting tonight. Um, I wish you'd have told me. I <laughs> no, well, you, you know, you, um, I can't say anything. Uh, members, we are going to item 4.1. Uh, which is the East West Bikeway. Uh, before we get to the recommendations, I'm going to hand to um, Director Devonish to just do a preamble for this item on tonight's agenda. Thank you, Lord Mayor, through you, Chair. Um, thanks, members, and I won't take up any more than a couple of minutes of your time, but just given the importance of this decision and the length that we've been deliberating, deliberating over it, I just need to introduce it, please. Tonight marks a very important milestone in the status of the East West Bikeway for Council. Consistent with the decision of Council on the 15th of December 2020, we've undertaken an extensive process in the last couple of months to provide to Council all the information it needs to make a decision on the progression or otherwise of the East West Bikeway. We provide this information based on the feedback and the strong and well-considered opinions of ratepayers, elected members and the stakeholders that have been engaged through the process. Um, in your papers, which I'm sure you've, um, you've all read so that we can take them as read, um, we've provided update on the bikeways funding deed, a summary of the community engagement, concept designs, cost estimates, cost benefit analysis, market sounding and the Prudential Report. The Prudential Report um, is a good place to start in that it confirms that Council has been provided with the information to satisfy the requirements of Council's Prudential Management Policy and Section 48 of the Local Government Act. There is only one final piece of information needed by Council, which is the whole of life cost of the infrastructure. Um, this has not been done due to some of the final form of the design still being uh, worked on. But the Prudential Report in principle outlines the identification, management and mitigation of risk. And before Council considers the options before it tonight, it's worthwhile considering these risks. In terms of strategic alignment, the East West Bikeway is aligned to Council's strategic um, plan for 2020 to 2024 and the City of Adelaide Act, as well as, as, well as other several, um, several other local and state strategies and plans. The funding deed, in terms of the funding deed, it's been well documented over the journey. Um, the Council, through its decisions, has advocated for state government funding to be made available um, to improve the city's bicycle networks. As a result of this advocacy, uh, Council entered into an agreement back on the 1st of July 2016, and that agreement uh, went through to the 30th of June 2018. Since July 2016, there have been 17 separate Council decisions um, regarding the North, South and East West bikeways and subsequent extensions to this deed. On the 23rd of December 2020, the Chief Executive of the Department of Infrastructure and Transport agreed to a further extension of time to the funding period for the Adelaide Bikeway Infrastructure Funding Deed um, beyond 30th of June this year to enable Council sufficient time to make a final decision. It was done on the following basis that the route alignment for the East West Bikeway is finalised by the 30th of March 2021, hence why we're here in front of you tonight and that its construction is practically complete and the bikeway is open for users no later than the 31st of December 2021. If a decision is not made on the East West Bikeway route prior to 31st of March 2021, Council would be in default of the funding deed and the grant funding allocated to the East West Bikeway would be forfeited, which you are aware of. In terms of community engagement, I just wanted to quickly say that the community consultation policy and the community engagement strategy based on the International Association of Public Participation has been followed. Um, the engagement process was designed to be inclusive, transparent and accountable. Did we ask every question we could have? Probably not. Could we have asked different questions? Yes, we probably could have. 
Um, we did get 436 responses through your say, 27% of those were ratepayers. There were 69 responses received via email or phone um, directly to our consultation team. One of the letters received was co-signed by 270 people. Feedback was received from several interest groups and we had feedback from 10 key stakeholders along the route, including the primary schools, uh, property owners, places of worship, um, and they were done by, um, in most cases, direct, uh, direct meetings face-to-face -face with our team. The full data sets have been provided to Council for consideration. The design, we have developed um, concept designs and they're included in your packs. Um, parking and traffic, traffic um, considerations, the installation of the bikeway will have some traffic impacts. Um, impacts are expected to include uh, removal of some turn lanes, minor changes to access, reduction in mid-block through lanes outside of peak periods on Franklin and Flinders streets in particular. There are proposed impacts to parking that are outlined in your papers. The total number of spaces likely to be removed is 179 for option one and 132 for option two. And as um, outlined in the Prudential report, the current assessment on lost parking income could be in the order of $89,000 to $498,000 per annum. We have done a cost um, estimate for the concept designs. Both of those designs come in within budget. That's included in your papers. The benefit cost ratio of the main case uh, sits at 2.2 at a 7% discount rate, which indicates that the benefits of the project exceed the cost of the project. Anything greater than one is generally positive. In terms of delivery, we've assessed the risk of being able to deliver by December. An initial market sounding exercise has been undertaken to understand the capacity of possible contractors in the market to deliver the works. Lastly, um, just in terms of risk, given the nature of this project and the multiple stakeholder interests, I think the residual project risk for this project is higher than most capital works of pro projects of this nature, however, very similar. Noted in the Prudential report are, are four key risks with a residual rating high enough that Council should consider carefully in their deliberations as, how, as to how they wish to approach. Um, the risks are that Council may not approve the East West Bikeway project within the time frame required in the funding deed. Another risk is failure to engage with a key stakeholder or criticism from a stakeholder that they have not been consulted by Council. High levels of public comment, uh, negative public commentary towards Council. And lastly, uh, failure to fulfil obligations of the overarching funding agreement. So it's now with Council just to assess that risk, um, the evidence before you and the information provided in the papers to provide us with the direction on how to progress the East West Bikeway. Um, I'm happy to answer questions and we do have the team here, Matthew Morrissey and, and our consultants here as well to respond to any queries. And this will go to the uh, recommendation for you. Can we ask questions first? Uh, yeah, certainly, certainly, yes. And it's just related to uh, the motion of 15th of December, uh, where we asked uh, the Lord Mayor to write to the Minister um, seeking not only changes to the deed, but the possibility that the, broad, the, the deed could be broadened to include other cycling infrastructure. Now, I note that that letter wasn't sent until two months later, until a few weeks ago, but have we had a response? Uh, no, Councillor Martin, we haven't had a response yet. Not yet. Okay, thank you. Councillor Donovan. Um, I don't have a question, Lord Mayor. I just want to move the motion if there are no other questions. No. So, Lutt, you have questions? I, I have questions, but I'm happy to move them from our class. Still yeah, um, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I just have some questions relating to mostly the preliminary report, which I've tapped and I'll go through as quickly as possible. Um, noting that this hasn't been through committee, of course. The, um, at page 27 in the report, it notes that we take a total of 738,000 per annum, um, and, and what Clinton said is, is also in there that we could have. 98 or I think it's just under 500,000 loss. Has, um, has, any, has any of that been modelled in our long-term financial plan with regards to our operating, operating surplus or deficit? Or? 
Oh, sorry, acting C. Uh, through the chair, no, that hasn't. Okay. So, in um, I suppose, if if for example we didn't prioritise um, further suggestion to mitigate costs, um, we and we had the four hundred eighty nine thousand dollar option, we would actually over the course of our long term financial plan be around five million dollars worse off by the end of it due to foregone revenue. Thing. That's correct. If we did nothing else. Um, one thing that wasn't entirely clear to me is: has that been included in the cost-benefit analysis that nine squared were asked to do? Through the C, through the acting C. Uh, through the chair, um, I don't believe it has been included um, in that, as it was um, the benefit-cost ratio was about um, tangibly identifying the benefits against the cost of. Project. So I don't believe that income related to the project has been taken into account. Okay. Um, all right. Understood. Um, if I can just go to the executive summary of the credential report, um, it also talks about, uh, in our view, the average approach used to estimate demand is likely to underestimate parking requirements through peak periods. Um, and and so is it is that the view? And I suppose this is directed through your mayor to Mr. Booth. Does that mean that potentially the um, the four hundred eighty nine thousand upper limit could that be lowballing the loss in revenue? I'm just trying to understand what the actual implications are. Yeah. Through the chair, no, my um, raising that is that I think there'll be people who can't park on street when they would like to park on street. I don't. Think, I think the demand estimates, the financial estimates, are reasonably accurate. So okay. Okay, so it's, it's more so the occupancy it's data. Office. We're not confident. I think there'll be people who have to park elsewhere as a consequence of. Okay, right, 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 right. understood. Um, and with regards to, and I know it was mentioned about risk, um, it talks about strong possibility the project won't be delivered in sufficient time to comply. And I understand if we made a decision to move ahead, then that's met that hurdle. But I note that 71102C, uh, page 35, uh, talks about likely timeframes involving engagement, completion, design works, procurement, and indicative construction timeframes. So, that's, that's saying that we might not, even if we made the decision tonight, we might not have this project completed in a capital work sense by, okay, by the demo. Through the acting C to Director Devnish. Yeah. Thank you, through the chair. Um, that is correct, those risks would exist, but I guess um, we need to get through the gate of a council decision first, and then um, we would then be looking at that risk in terms of the project delivery risk, which we would do on any given project. Yeah, thank you. And, but one thing I thought was silent on it didn't sort of flag that we may lose component of the of the deed, or some or all of the deed, if that if we were to meet that hurdle. So are you asking what the consequence if we don't actually complete by December twenty one? Yeah. We lose it. Through the chair at this point in time, that's not clear. We would have to um, work very closely with our. Um, deed partner in DIT and agree on the time frame for delivery of the project, but at this point in time they've specified 31st of December completion. Okay. Um, and there were a couple of other points um, that I picked up on. And just, just regarding process wise, and given that's been topical, the um, at 1 4 link framework talks about uh, the Local Government Act requiring this under Section 48, that's all very perfunctory, but we were originally asked to make a decision about this in December and we didn't have the benefit of a report like this. It, it, the, the, the nature of what we're considering hasn't majority changed in that time. Could we have potentially been in breach of Section 48 if if we approved the bikeway at that, at that time without this prudential report handy? Um, acting C or Director Devnish? Um, through the Chair, I don't believe we would have been in breach of it based on the decision of Council at the time. So I think we were in a position where um, notwithstanding um, progress on the East-West Bikeway, in any case we would have had to have um, provided a prudential report based just purely on the dollar amount of um, the infrastructure, so I don't think we would have been breached. Okay, understood. Um, and just at 2265 um, on page 11, it says, uh, given the project design is yet to be finalised, it's unclear whether the capital funding provision will be adequate or not, although I know you've got estimates, but um, uh, is, there, is there a contingency that's been put aside for this project? Okay. 
uh, through the chair, um, the project design is yet to be finalised. However, we have had cost estimates done by Rider Levitt Buckland, our cost estimator, and they've included sufficient contingency within those cost estimates. So there is a level of confidence that we will be within the budget. Um, and just a final question, it's not on the presidential report, it's just around consultation. Um, on the 2nd of April 2019, this or our committee of council considered um, a result of a motion that I put to, to develop a consultative, consultative framework for future bikeway infrastructure. That's the that's the framework. So that was on was 1.5 consultation strategy and workshop that we did. Was was this used? Was this given to Holmes Dyer through Lord Mayor and used to guide their because so sorry, just for a reference. Sorry, so we developed this framework. Council developed it, came to us in a workshop, which was originally requested by Councillor Donovan, um, Bikeways Network on the 2nd of April. Yep. It's a fairly detailed, it's got stage one, two, three A, three B, three C, around how we would actually approach consultation on a bikeways network. Was this given so, the same So the question is, did we use the framework for time to time? Uh, through the chair, I, I can't answer the question directly other than to say that um, a full consultation and community engagement strategy and plan was developed by Holmes Diet before mm -hmm. commencing. Um, maybe I could, do you know if we've included that um, that in the pack? Have to take it on notice if we can't answer. Uh, through the chair, I'll have to take it on notice. Uh, my understanding is that we undertook, uh, regardless of th that documentation, we uh, prepared a pack and, and brought that to chamber, including questions to uh, take you out to community. That was adopted, and that's the consultation pack we took out to community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sims. Thanks, um, Lord Mayor. Uh, so if um, we don't uh, commit to this tonight. Um, we are at risk of losing or breaching the, the deed um, with the state government. Has that um, occurred before um, in terms of council projects? Is there any precedent for that in the in the city of Adelaide? Acting C. Uh, through the through the chair, um, I can't think of one. I can't say that it hasn't happened, but I, nothing's jumping to mind. So, were council to default on um, the deed and, um, you know, in effect, give back the, the money to the state government, this would be the first time that uh, council has ever done that in relation to a um, public works project in recent memory. I think the acting CEO says that, uh, to her knowledge, we have, but we can't actually state. And, and can I just ask, is. how long um, has the um, acting CEO been working at the City of Adelaide? I think that's no, actually no, more no, to no, do it's, it's, when she would have been in a position. I'm just just wondering in terms not, of in your. No, I'm sorry, I won't. I'm not okay. going there um, because it's a matter of who's in a position to accept or implement a grant, and okay. um, that may not have happened over the full duration of the acting city being present. Um, I will go to Councillor Donovan. To move the motion. I'd like to move the motion as written with option six, approve the curbside separated bike lane. And I will seek a seconder. Councillor Sims, Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I think we need to get back to the essence of why we are here tonight after many moons and first of all, thanking council administration because I cannot imagine um, the process that they have been through through this very arduous process to get to this point. The City of Adelaide is responsible for all transport uses. We are responsible for pedestrians, for cars, for bikes. We are responsible for scooters, for prams, for wheelchair users, all transport users. And at this point in time, up to this date, we have primarily focused on provision for cars. We know that only 34% of people travelling into the city travel by car. And up to this point, we are not satisfying the safe opportunity for other users to get into the city and to move through the city. We know that we have ample car parking. We This issue does come up and it is certainly a perception that it is very important for us to address. We do need to be mindful of the feedback that we received back from our ratepayers about that perception. But importantly, we, the council, have the data to know that the City of Adelaide being approximately a third the size of Melbourne and a fifth the size of Sydney, 
We have 50% more car parking than Melbourne. We have double the amount of car parking in Sydney. So we cannot by any means suggest that more car parking relates to a thriving city economy. We need to remember that tonight's decision is of course not just about one street. So we are fixated on this one street, but this is part of our plan. This is part of our plan strategic decision-making to create a network of separated bikeways as part of our overall transport plan within the city. We're doing this in alignment with best practice. We're doing this in alignment with the evidence that we have that says as we provide a network of separated bikeways to the city, we enable an additional approximately 64% of the population to make short trips by car. So at present, about 3% of those who would choose to ride are riding. We enable another 64% to ride, which means additional thousands of people on bikes who are able to access the network. So what does this equate to? Not only does this increase safety for current users, it increases safety for all users. We know that as we enable more people to walk and cycle, it actually increases safety for all users on the road. It also means that as we plan for our goal in 2050 of supposedly doubling our city's population, we are actually ensuring that we're providing a system by which we don't create more congestion. So if we want to allow for on-street car parking to be more available, literally the only way we can do that is by putting in better access to public transport, walking and cycling. That evidence is very clear. It's clear for Adelaide, it's clear for every other city in Australia and in the world. We don't need to create this evidence, it is sitting there for us. This is not about any one of us looking at what is our personal private way of travelling into the city. It is about how we set up the network Mendes, for the community. Can we have more time? Admin have provided us with so much information. They've provided us way back with the Smart Move strategy. They've recently provided us, as summarised by Clinton, with an abundance of information that shows us that this is the best way to move forward. We most recently have the Prudential report, which shows, as Clinton mentioned, that for every dollar we put in, and this is a very conservative estimate, we get at least another dollar back, 2.2 in fact. So we know that this has benefits over time. When we look to some of those smaller um, costs and um, council hired raised the cost of revenue through the Prudential report. We know that in fact the only way for us to enable all of the people that we want to move into these apartments that have no car parking and to gain the rates that we gain over time from those, those, those apartments is literally to support more active transport. We know that through this process we will have people who will, who will find this change uncomfortable and that is why it is our job as councillors to look to the evidence, to work through the iterative process that our transport team is taking us through and through this iterative process to work through the finer details. As has already been achieved, the transport team has come up with some very elegant um, responses to ensure that people can cross the bikeway safely. They've got some, um, they've worked through some of the areas around the schools to ensure that there are buffers. And in fact, all of these options increase safety for pedestrians and for road users. So I hope that tonight, as we look to the decision making, we go not to perceptions, but actually we look to all of the evidence that we have and we move toward our strategic intent recognising this as one street in a network that we will be moving toward over time. Uh, thank you, Councillor Donovan. Councillor Sims? I'll reserve my right to Members. If not, I'll go back to, so Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I have um, a suspicion that this is not going to uh, succeed um, tonight. Um, and I think that's a great um, shame because, you know, over the um, five, six years that I've had involvement with this council, this has been a perennial um, debate. The reality is that, you know, change is hard in, in a city um, and it's hard in a city like, you know, the city of Adelaide, as is the experience um, in other parts of the world. And, you know, I was actually just looking up online when um, Rundle Mall was um, built. Uh, was made a, um, a pedestrian uh, thoroughfare, and that was in 1972, Lord Mayor. And at that time, 
People said, well, the sky's going to fall in, it's going to be the end of business as we know it. You know, pedestrianising the street's going to be an absolute nightmare, no one's going to go there. And now it has become one of the premier um, business hubs of our city. And the experience overseas shows us that actually when you build cycling infrastructure, there is an economic uplift um, and it does support um, small business. Um, so, you know, I feel really disappointed that um, it seems that once again, the council is not going to take action on this. Um, and I feel very, very disappointed um, that we are not, if this motion fails tonight, that we are not going to be showing the leadership we need on our climate crisis. Um, we've seen here in South Australia the impact of uh, bushfires. Um, we're seeing interstate at the moment the impact of terrible floods. South Australia has um, played a role in terms of trying to fight climate change. The city of Adelaide has had a long-term plan in terms of being a carbon neutral city. But I see um, encouraging active transport as being a key part of any strategy. How can we really purport to be a carbon neutral city if we do not have a network of um, separated bikeways? I mean, how can we pass on um, that opportunity? You look at what's been happening all around the world, um, Lord Mayor, in terms of uh, the response to COVID-19, a range of cities have taken action to build separated bikeways, recognising that they're essential for, com for building community health and wellbeing, recognising that there have been more pedestrians out on our streets and so on. What has the City of Adelaide done in that time? Nothing. The wheels have been, been spinning, but there's been no action. And I think collectively, we as a council need to take responsibility for that. I think it is deeply disappointing. And um, a lot of people in the city will be scratching their heads saying, what on earth are you guys doing? Why won't you deliver this? I mean, there's been so many, just a minute more, Lord Mayor. Members. Thanks. Um, there's been so many different iterations of this project. This is the opportunity to finally make it happen. And um, so I encourage members, you know, come on, let's finally do something here. Let's stop the backpedaling and the spinning of the wheels and actually take some action. But um, I would, uh, before Councillor Donovan sums up, Lord Mayor, really welcome hearing your views um, on the proposal, if you don't mind. I, I did see your hand up. Thank you, Councillor Hart. Um, just at the outset, I'd like to flag that we spend more on environment and sustainability, including carbon neutral Adelaide, every year than we've got committed or potentially committed to this one project. That's at $3.2 million. So, and we are, in fact, a carbon neutral organisation. Um, uh, and uh, credit to the City of Adelaide no, for that. We're yeah. buying cheese. Oh. If I could continue. Um, now, I suppose, Lord Mayor, I am, there are a lot of things that um, concern me and not, not even the Prudential report I only got to yesterday, um, but before then. Um, one of the things that, that concerns me is that, of course, transport planning theory says that pedestrians uh, should be at the, at the top of the hierarchy as far as safety goes. Um, uh, and I'm worried about how this will go for pedestrians. And I'm worried about the feedback that I've had from schools who highlight they've each got around a thousand students. Um, and as much as I, you know, uh, applaud the administration for working options in for them when you've got a thousand students coming in the morning and a thousand going home in the evening, um, we can we can lead a horse to water, but you can't necessarily make it drink. And I think uh, kids being as they are, many of them will just traverse across the bikeway, and we can't have any control of that. And that's potentially going to make safety issues for those pedestrians and decrease the user experience for the cyclists as well. So first and foremost, I'm concerned about pedestrian safety um, uh, with this option. Now, um, and as well, the um, what also concerns me and it's been publicly aired is the consultation process that's happened here. Now, in um, February 2019, I amended a motion of Councillor Donovan's and um, I suggested that we develop a consultation framework. And that consultation framework, which as I'm pretty sure was not used by the administration, lays out quite in a detailed fashion. It's quite a detailed document. And it says what you'll do in stage one, stage two, stage three A, three B and three C. 
Now those stages would take a little bit of time each time. Now, of course, when this came to us in December, we weren't even going to consult. We didn't have the benefit of a credential report, which is damning, by the way. But we weren't even going to consult. And then we didn't even provide this consultation framework that we developed, that we wrote at council's request. We didn't even provide that to our consultant who we paid to undertake the work for us. Um, now, part of that is probably because there wouldn't have been enough time to have such a meaningful consultation. Well, we've got people saying, I got your letter with one and a half days left to put into the consultation. Now, I pleaded with administration, just extend it for a week. Just please extend it for a week. And I was told we needed a decision of council to do that. Um, and so that wasn't possible. But I actually think, had we consulted properly and meaningfully, this may have had a better chance of success and we wouldn't see, be seeing some of the legal challenges we're seeing now. Um, but of course, Lord Mayor, then, then disregarding the safety issues and the consultation issues, which are two of the things that should be paramount in our decision making, I just want to pick up on this thing, the iterative, the iterative process. Now, iterative, the root word is iteration. And iteration, in previous versions thereof, now I can see this being iterative, just like Rome, Rome was iterative. You built it, you rip it up. Halifax, if I could have another minute, Lord Members. Mayor. Halifax was iterative. We built that and ripped that up. Oh, sorry, stir. Um, we built that and ripped that up. Iterative is code for we don't know if this is going to work and we may have to rip it up. Um, that's how I interpret that. Various iterations. And I'm really concerned that this is going to be a front street. Um, that's what I'm really worried about. Now, I want to see safe cycling options in the city. Um, uh, and we've ar arrived at this point, not for want of trying on my part. 12 months ago, I pleaded with the administration. I said, you need to get your design guide right first. You need to do your design guide first. You need to have many different options, many different infrastructure treatments for the many different streets that we have in the city. Now, had that been done, we would have far more tools in the kit with which to solve this problem. But it hasn't been done, Lord Mayor. 12 months, and I know it was a, it was a tough 12 months, but there was nothing, there was little done in that time. And we get locked at 10 minutes to midnight. We have a quick workshop talking about essentially what we've got in front of us today. And that's just not good enough. Now, if we had done that work, if we had thought about planning, if I could just have 30 seconds more. Just to close off, thanks. If we could have thought about planning, how are we going to connect our network to the suburbs? How is that, you know, the bike direct routes, how is that going to then come into the park plans? How do we connect our streets and including our shared use zones, which we haven't thought about yet, really. We haven't thought about our shared use zones. How do we then connect that across a, a city-wide network. We don't have that. And, 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 and by the cycling lobby's own admission, we're not going to see the uplift, the economic benefits, the health benefits, until we flick the switch on a full network. And this is the problem for us, Lord Mayor. So, you know, I, I would like to see separated bike lanes in the city. I honestly think we need to go back to square one on this. We need to do it properly from the beginning. I don't want from road version 2.0. That's what we're are being asked to approve tonight. We cannot have that, um, and, and don't even let me get started on the finances of the situation because we all know that very well. Uh, Councillor Knoll. I have to say that uh, in the first breath, this is one of the most difficult ones I've come uh, I've had to deal with in council, and it certainly has been uh, you know, bothering me a lot. How what is the best uh, way we can go about this? And I looked at this, and when I went through the project, a sort of uh, uh, you know, it is only. Uh, one uh, connection through, this, uh, through the city. And uh, the problem that we have is, uh, first and foremost, that we do not have a, a, a proper cohesive network plan. And I, I do wish to bring to see a, a motion forward about that uh, by the next uh, you know, council. Um, but the point is, is that uh, we need to bring people from the, uh, from the suburbs through the parklands into the city. We already have, uh, you know, we have bikeways that are around the city, but there's no easy plan that links all these together. So there's quite a few uh, issues in there with how do we get them across into town safely. And there are many safe uh, ways to get in the city, but they're not connected necessarily to, to, the, to the source points where people are going to come from. We're only doing this through one street. So there's a lot of other issues that we can look at that will improve the, the safety of, uh, the, of the bike network which will be far more valuable than just doing one street. And I have to say, the, with all of the, the issues that became apparent here, um, it got less and less appealing. And the cost uh, of, of us doing this right now in this form uh, means that it is quite prohibitive. And uh, we talk about car parks all the time. The difficulty you have is at this point, was one of the thought, thoughts I had was that it's the best solution, is that there are no other secondary car parks that people can use. In the other north and south, there are car parks in high-rise high uh, car parks 
as alternatives. Here, there's not. It's all flat. So therefore, for those businesses requiring it, those people going there requiring it, it doesn't work. Uh, there's virtually no buses along those routes. So again, people, there's no other alternative. And we also remember that uh, our, our issues we've got first is that people coming to town, that means uh, buses and that is the only network that will provide uh, en masse sufficient to bring people from greater distances because within that five kilometer zone, it's mainly uh, large, uh, substantial and older suburbs that don't have that, that population that will tend to ride uh, and particularly using the city. And most of our bike riders are uh, workers and that's seen by Frome Road and the Frome Road has trafficked with, the, uh, uh, with COVID. And that tells me that, of course, there are less other people wanting to use the city. But if we're talking about families, most family, if most family um, destinations are either in the parklands or adjacent to parklands. So we're able to get most families to the things they want to go to, because the city is mainly for commerce or where you where you live there, and that's uh, obviously that's a separate conversation. So. Um, you know, there is less likelihood of families so far coming to the middle of the city because all the things that they would generally look for as family groups is not necessarily within town. So it is very much about specific destinations, etc. Um, we're also unique in Adelaide. The fact that all these other cities have had embedded uh, public transport systems which survived changes of government, and that's our biggest problem. If, just again, um, you know. make it stop. It's the bill this Council Moran. Um, um, members, sorry, just wrong. Thank you. I mean, uh, the main issue is is that uh, uh, you know in the Plaford government they took out the the, uh, the buses, uh, the should say the trams. So we were no longer able to have that co uh, con uh, connected, continuous other form of transport, which would have mitigated the amount of cars that people need to come into town. But so that in itself dictated that Adelaide was going to be a car city rather than anything else. So like Los Angeles, we have this problem and this problem has to be uh, now altered and the alter is not going straight to bikes necessarily. They're part of the solution, but they're not going to deliver enough people to uh, make it possible. So that, you know, we need to get look at all of the ways of getting people in the city and then work them together. But again, a wholesome network using these uh, the facilities of uh, the streets where we have and the laneways and enabling people to use them better and connect them easily will give us a far better, uh, quicker uh, solution to the whole city, not just one street. So I think if we just, uh, and sadly, uh, uh, I, I see this as a, as a bigger problem, the bigger solution we need to come Thank up. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Thank you. Councillor Moran. Well, I find it enormously amusing to watch Team Adelaide try to justify not supporting this dedicated bikeway. With all the words, all the money, you never were going to. This is just delaying tactics. On this issue, I'm with you. Um, we are nowhere near the same <laughs> fair of hands. <laughs> 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 but then I have always, no, that is not hypocrisy. I have always had concerns about council being able to handle these projects. Can't, the council has made a muck of them. Um, we worried about um, road works outside certain city pubs ruining their business. We left their defence. Um, I think dedicated bikeways are the way of the future. I agree with Helen, but uh, I don't know whether anybody's noticed how well this council council handles these the building of these dedicated bikeways. They handle it appallingly. And from what I've heard tonight in the confidential section and the thing, we are nowhere. We have not moved on to any uh, platform that I could be perfectly comfortable. We've got ideas of middle down the middle of the road. And it's just a nightmare. Um, I feel very sorry for Helen. Um, this is, was really her um, raison d'etre to be on this council, and if perhaps she worked on it earlier, we might be in a better place. But we're getting legal advice hitting us at the last minute that our administration hasn't even um, has just read. We've had legal threats from businesses, and I think they're justified. Um, my main concern: this will be going down in a screaming heap tonight. Um, because there has not been the spade work before. Uh, there's been a lot of chit chat and there's been a lot of one for her spending so much on green things. Oh, we can't do anything until there's, a, there's a, a network of communicating things. This is the old let's wait till everything's perfect and we'll do it. It's never going to be perfect, but it'd be a lot more perfect than this. Uh, so I would ask that I think the important thing is the $3 million. We, of course, want to make our bike way safer for people. There are other ways. My husband rides his bike to work and he suggests many others. Uh, 
greening the entire surface using uh, rumble bars like they do on the end of the freeway to, to show the cars when they're entering into the bike path to spend some money on dedicated traffic lights for bikes at intersection where it's always quite difficult because you're often turning over the dedicated bike way and throwing road. So I'm not anti-bike, but um, I have no confidence that we know what we're doing in this instance. And uh, when, if and when we do, then I will support it. But it's nowhere near it now. Members? Councillor Mackey and Councillor Adams. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, a question and, uh, and and some reflections. Um, which would you like first, the question or the reflections? Okay. Okay. Well, the question, um, uh, just just to underscore Councillor Sims, uh, a question to you. This is an important uh, matter that the community would value uh, uh, before making a decision hearing from you your views with regard to this matter, and then I'm happy to um, contribute my questions or do it the other way around, my no, comments. We, when everybody's finished speaking, okay. you're all speaking now. Did you have? I do, I do have some um, reflections to share. Thank you. Um, I am pro separated bikeways. I was a retailer for over 20 years in this city in the mid eighties through to the beginning of the noughties. Um, and in the mid 90s, um, footpath widening had the effect of reducing by one third the number of on street car parks in, the, uh, in Hindley Street. As a retailer in Hindley Street, I was convinced it would be the end of life as we knew it. Uh, despite the fact that I'd lobbied for about 15 years to get council to pay some love to, um, the, to Hindley Street, um, it wasn't the end of life as we knew it. Um, in fact, our business grew. Um, so I, I'm chastened by my own fear uh, and the reality that, that came after that. Um, now, having only arrived back uh, to serving council 10 months ago, uh, and through no particular fault of any one particular uh, member or group of members, or indeed one council term or other council terms, I've arrived to a dog's breakfast. Uh, dog's breakfast trail of resolutions, revocations, regrets and reposts. The saga goes back over three terms um, and I really want to commend the administration and the consultants who've been undertake, who've undertaken the work uh, to uh, prepare honest endeavours to respond to decisions uh, as uh, Clinton uh, Devonish said 17 times as successive councils have flip-flopped uh, and acceded to pressure groups who, albeit genuine in their beliefs, and I absolutely want to express, uh, underscore that, very genuine in their beliefs, their fears, their concerns about disruption to um, their life as they know it. Um, the, the, the government, state government, would have absolutely understand. We, we, I would not be at all surprised if they took the money back and decided to allocate it to other local government areas uh, who are in a position, in a better position than we are, uh, to move forward on this. I, I, I so wanted to support this um, uh, next stage of the bikeway, and honestly and truly, and it's, it's kept me awake at night, uh, uh, and I've spoken to many, many, many stakeholders, I'm completely not convinced that um, the model, the two models that have been put forward, um, are actually going to um, do anything more than create enduring angst. Uh, and part of that goes back to the way we consulted. Um, and I agree with Councillor Hyde. We actually need a more fully considered, consulted and integrated approach to how we achieve bikeway, uh, a, a, a workable north, south, east, west, not just one cross, but actually a network. Um, and so regretfully, I won't be supporting this motion. Thank you. I have Councillor Abraham's name. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll, I'll be brief, given that we've discussed this um, item uh, here in this room and also in the Chamber many times. Um, um, what is clear to me, Lord Mayor, is that um, the number of um, times we have discussed this, the uh, a lot of the uh, members and also those who have made deputations, even when it has been against uh, uh, this particular project, has been that um, they're, they're supportive of a bikeway. So let's not forget that. The why for 
um, most of us, if not all of us, is there, and we all agree on it, is the how and the what that we need to uh, work out. That's that's one uh, one thing I want to highlight. But also the second thing, uh, Lord Mayor, is as Councillor Hyde uh, highlighted earlier about um, uh, stakeholder and community engagement. I think um, leadership is about engaging with your uh, community. Leadership is about getting that community buy-in and essentially taking the community there. Leadership is not dragging the community, kicking and screaming. So I think given that we did have some um, time frame challenges, given that we had uh, the uh, grant funding terms and conditions, we had to do what we did. But if we were to have a crack at it again, I'm hopeful that we are able to get something uh, that will um, that the community can actually have some buy-in, and uh, um, every every one of majority of people will be uh, will be supportive of. Uh, now, members, oh sorry, I I am very conscious of the time uh, because I'm going to have to adjourn and then uh, hand over to the chair for the committee, and then we'll also I'm looking for a mover that, to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Martin, and a second, Councillor Knoll. Members, those in favour. Thank you. That is carried. Um, I now close the meeting and hand over to the chair for committee. Do you want to just explain to the gallery? Uh, the sorry, meeting? gallery. It's just we have a committee meeting. Please don't leave. We have a committee meeting. Um, we're going to open that and close it and go back into the council meeting. No. Sorry, it'll be about thirty seconds. I advise that the special meeting of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording that will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected and used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Adi. Council acknowledges that we are meeting. No, no, and we just need to open the meeting. That's it. Oh, yes. Yes. Jenny told me to just. I can't. On which one is it? I'll join. Okay, I'll join this meeting. So you need a move. I have to move. Oh, happy to move. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Councillor Hyde. Those in favour? Those against? Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you, members. I'll now reopen the special council meeting of the 23rd of March. We're good? Okay. Um, so, now I did see two hands. I saw Councillor Martin and uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you have your hand? Councillor Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I must say, I've found many of the arguments that have been put to me um, uh, less than persuasive. Um, uh, the safety issue is um, a familiar argument, that is to say that somehow this bikeway is going to be so dazzling that children will stumble across it and come to grief. And it's very similar to the argument that Councillor Sims would remember when we proposed a, a rainbow walk, it was suggested that children would lurch towards it and in the process of doing so would be run over by cars or bikes. Um, <laughs> it is in fact a, a furphy, it's a furphy. And indeed, the, the cost arguments are also. This is a budgeted proposal. It's in all of our financial uh, calculations. Um, and uh, uh, I would have thought um, it is, particularly when it's subsidised by the state government, affordable. But as uh, one of the speakers said, don't get me started on costs. I do understand we are deeply in debt. If we were a private company, we would be in receivership. I understand that. However, this is a matter, oh yes, we have debt of $210 million and unless we sell $60 million worth of assets, we will be in deep strife. This is a council that has ruined the financial future of the city of Adelaide and now uses that argument to say we can't afford a bikeway. We've ruined the, uh, the city of Adelaide's finances and now you're going to pay for it without a bikeway. So I, I hear these arguments. The one that is missing, and the one that I most regret I didn't hear, is that this was never going to happen because we have an ideological mindset against a bikeway. 
that's that's what this history is about from 2016. No, we don't want this. I remember the leader of Team Adelaide saying, let's put it down Piri Weymouth. That delayed things for a long time. Then some other cop suggested we do something past the central market. Um, there have been just a series of proposals all designed to get us to this point where with some flimsy arguments, it can be said, we cannot do this bike way. We could do this bike way. And the Lord Mayor has repeatedly said, this is my goal in this term of council, we will have an east-west bikeway. But the majority of council, and it is majority, and indeed the advertiser uh, emailed to me the voting figures at lunchtime today, so it's well understood, at least in journalism, what the outcome of this vote will be. It, the outcome is sadly going to render our Lord Mayor in the public view as impotent. She cannot persuade her council to deliver to her the bikeway she's promised. It, it, it is impotence, it is imposed by the team, it is disappointing. Uh, Lord Mayor, I, I seriously think that this is a mistake. Members? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't want it, Lord Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, I am simply going to say that um, this this matter will be a matter of great regret for many, many years. Members, as you speak to the motion, you are supposed to say whether you are speaking for or against the motion. Um, that's actually how you address the motion in debate. So oh, it would be I, really good if we have an understanding as we go around. Are any doubt about how I feel about it? <laughs> I actually don't know whether you're for or against the motion at all, Councillor Martin. Oh, I'm actually for an east-west bikeway, uh, but you know, I, I can see, I can see the reality that Team Adelaide will not support it. And so, I does that mean you are it. supporting the motion, Councillor Martin? I support a east-west bikeway. Thank you, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry, 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 Lord Mayor, I just would like to ask you to ask Councillor Martin to withdraw the imputation that somehow people known as Team Adelaide impose this will on you. I, I really take great offence to the idea that somehow myself or other councillors imposed their will upon you. Um, and I think it's grossly improper. Well, Councillor Martin, Lord, Lord, I'd, I'd like you to withdraw the uh, the comment about me being impotent as well. I find that quite insulting. Oh, no, 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 I'm not suggesting that. Thank uh, you. Uh, no, and I'm to saying to you, Lord Mayor, if the team does not support you, Thank then you. you will be seen. Councillor Martin. Well. Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, do you want me to answer the other issue? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it just it sounds like you know this is a war against bikeways, um, and uh, and it's not a war against bikeways. It's actually the culture that we have here is that we do rely on our cars, and the thought of people not being able to bring a uh, drive their car into and park it efficiently in the city. It actually creates fear to these business owners, and you know they invest their livelihood and their money, everything into this city, and to actually have the thought that they may lose on potential customers or clients coming into the city, into their businesses, is actually a fear. So what we have failed in all of this, and in previous term of council, and in the discussion of all bikeways, is that we haven't taken people on a journey of what this could mean for the city and on the long term. All we've done is shoved it down people's throats. And it's all it's become is a political war between what Councillor Martin calls a team Adelaide in this term of council, and last term, oh God knows what he called it. So um, I um, really think that, you know, it's becoming- <laughs> um, exist. Thank you. Probably Sorry, problematic um, in order to have uh, doing projects in, in isolation. And this is what it becomes. It becomes political. And it's really sad that as a capital city, we cannot deliver a bike way because of the political agenda with councillors in this council. And it's 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 sad. Okay. And in saying no, that no, to and don't 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 that to your you speaking that okay. don't you are interrupt. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Again. Councillor Moran, please stop I interrupting. In actual fact, if you let me finish, Councillor Moran, you might find out. Wow. So I, I actually am the one that suggested maybe we consult on a middle bike lane. Um, because I would feel that we need a balance between what the culture of our city is about and moving potentially to separated bikeways. 
understanding that it was a definite no from the report and it wasn't very well received. So I take that on board. In my opinion, it seems as if I can see history repeating itself um, because it will be, um, as Councillor Mackey said, which I was saying before, it's going to end up being a dog's breakfast, not a dog's leg. It's very clear that it's not going to be very well received by the public and we might end up uh, ripping it up again, just like we did with Foam Road and just like Councillor Hyde said, it will be version Foam Road 2.0. So I really don't think that this city and uh, this council can deliver this bikeway and I hope and I hope to God that we can actually deliver it in the future and I think we need to have a more realistic view on what um, the ratepayers want within this city and we have to listen and we have to take on board. So rather than this becoming a mess and costing us more money, I would vote against this bikeway at the present time. I'm open to a discussion of having something in the future. I'm open to actually having a more meaningful consultation and I'm open to having a more of a, taking people more of a journey on this. Um, so that is my answer to the question in regards to myself, if I just support this presently, but I would like to have more discussions about this in the future. Um, Members, are there any other speakers? If not, I will say some words. Um, <coughs> Councillor Moran, I will ask you to stop interrupting. I'll, I'll point you a few times there, so if you could please allow speakers to speak, that would be appreciated. Well, I was just saying, Lord Mayor, that you'd ask me <laughs> Councillor Moran. Voting for or against. And she did answer that. Thank you, Councillor Moran. So, members, I think, you know, again, uh, it's been an interesting discussion. Um, I also have spoken to many stakeholders over the last period of time, um, and I, whereas I'm not convinced that either of these options are actually going to deliver for our stakeholders, and the Prudential report is also really calls out the disruption and also the stakeholders that are not supporting this, which are the schools and the businesses and the churches. However, um, we are a capital city and I find it in incredible that in the you know, year 2021 that we can't deliver a separated bikeway. This is about active transport, which means actually using your body to move in the same way that you would walk around a city. This is about integrated transport so that we actually look at it alongside our cars, alongside our trams and buses and every other sort of form of transport. As uh, some of you know, uh, I was the uh, director to Favello City a few years ago. And uh, also, Farm Street was a pilot project, which was to show that you can have a separated bikeway in the city. They may have got it wrong, but it was a pilot. And the entire length cost $1.2 million, which I think was per even you know half of the cost per block when we finally delivered it. Um, so it is actually the way of the future. Now, we may not be able to deliver this in this term, which is, I'm very sad to say. I do actually think that we do need to start again. And perhaps the way to go is a whole of city consultation to really look at how we get that city-wide integrated transport working. Um, I have met and spoken with Councillor Donovan on many occasions about this bikeway uh, because I had very much hoped that we would be able to deliver that in this council term. Um, of course, I'm bound by the decision of the council, but this is the way of the future. And whether we do it now or in five years time, we have to understand that the future is not cars and the future will be integrated transport. And perhaps the trigger point will when we do actually grow our residential population within the city, which will actually be looking at other ways to traverse the city. Um, it's also, uh, perhaps we need more cyclists on council, Councillor Donovan. Um, but it is also uh, the reason that we do separate it is for safety. And, you know, if you are going to do separated, that encourages a lot of people who may not be confident to ride on our roads as they are currently. Um, so I will leave it to the will of the council. I will respect the decision of the council um, and that we can hopefully. Uh, relook at where we go from here in terms of consultation processes and also what that might deliver for our city going forward. With that, I'll go to Councillor Dolben to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I do ride, um, but I will ride pretty much everywhere. So a separated bikeway is not for me. 
It is for the 67% of the population that would choose to ride and are looking for a safe option to do so. I'm a health psychologist. The reason why I push this forward is because this is one of the most effective ways to improve population-based health, both mental and physical. And it is unbelievable some of the comments that are being made tonight um, and to briefly address some of them, uh, Councillor Hyde, rest assured, transport theory supports separated bikeways and supports and shows in every instance that they are an improvement to pedestrian safety. Our job as councillors is to take the information that we have from our expert transport planners and when we are when we are addressed by constituents with some of those fears, some of those perceptions, it is our job to address those fears and perceptions with the facts, the evidence that we have been provided with over the last several years that we have been on council. Um, in terms of council Kuros, we do rely on our cars because we have no other option. That is true. <laughs> We rely on our cars because we have no other option. That is the point of putting in a separated bikeway. We know Jevons paradox tells us, we have been told over and over by our transport planners that we need the network before we will have people choosing to ride. We cannot expect that we will have a massive influx of people on bikes until we have the network. So of course we are reliant on cars because we have no other good option. We also know that we do not require the car parking that we have in the CBD. We know that we rarely hit even 80% occupancy. So losing the 1% of car parking that we are predicted to lose based on the option that has been put forward will make close to zero difference in terms of revenue or the number of people who are choosing to come to the city because we have an abundance of car parking. We will not saturate that in any time, even when we have fringe and all of crazy march. We do not hit 80% occupancy of our car parking. Of course, we need a cohesive uh, city access strategy. Of course we do, which is part of what is coming through the city access strategy planning process. However, we have already been provided with all of the information to show that this is one of the key networks that will contribute to the network. So there is no, in terms of Councillor uh, Hyde's suggestion that we need some magical design guide, there's no magical design guide that will alleviate the requirement to remove car parks on a street to put in a separated bikeway. No such design guide exists. There is no street where we can put a separated bikeway in an east-west direction and require no car parks to be removed. So this, these furbies and these endless excuses around, well, we need to look at a different option and a different treatment and we need more ideas. Time and time again, the issue that comes up is that we, have, we can't lose any car parking. We know we have an abundance of it and we know there's no option where we won't be removing car parking. There are secondary car parks all throughout the city. So that again is an absolute furphy. The councillor Kamal's point about people within five kilometres won't choose to ride because they're old. Oh my goodness, where to begin? Where to begin? We know that is completely untrue. We have demographic data to show that there is an abundance of people within the five kilometre range that would choose to ride. And of course there'll be disruption from this project as there would any other project that we have in the CBD. Do you require extra time, Councillor? Uh, ten seconds. Ten seconds, ten love seconds. Um, <laughs> of Don't course, worry. of course, there will be disruption, just as there will be with the market, just as there will be with 88 O'Connell, just as there is when we resurface a road. We don't not progress because there's disruption from a project. Councillor Abraham, today you said leadership. What an utter failure of leadership if we do not progress one street of this bike network with the $3 million that we have from the state to actually make some steps toward where we know we need to get to. Are we really gonna delay for four years a whole term of council and not get any progress on active transport? That would be an utter leadership failure, an utter failure of any strategic intent in the realm of transport if we fail on this tonight. Members, on that note, we will go to the vote. Those in favour, those against, that is lost. Division. Yeah. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour, please stand and remain standing. The has been called. Councillor Sims, Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan. 
Thank you, members. Uh, that takes us to the second item on tonight's agenda, which is 4.2, the Community Land Revocation James Place Public Toilets. And I will look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Hyde and the seconder. Councillor Abraham's today. Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak? Councillor Abraham's today. Members, Councillor Martin. Uh, look, Lord Mayor, uh, timely to observe that um, this is an extraordinary position to be in. That is to say that last June the city agreed to sell these public toilets to enable the development of that site, which is currently proceeding. Uh, the toilets are there, um, barely, uh, through the, uh, the demolition site. Um, and we're asking our ratepayers have asked, as the demolition was beginning, uh, whether they wanted to revoke the community title. And tonight we're accepting those results which show the community by majority does not want to see that community title revoked. Uh, and yet the document is signed, the site is a demolition site, um, and there is no way of reversing the outcome. Um, it is just the kind of process that actually renders our credibility pretty low in the city of Adelaide. Um, I'm disappointed, uh, disappointed not least because the city um, has squandered half a million dollars of its own money on this project. Half a million dollars is the figure that was used. $800,000 of government subsidy as well went into it. We created a, a, a public toilet facility that had a change facility. Um, there is not to be one during the construction phase. We are promised one when the project is complete, but that's going to be governed uh, by the framework of a land management agreement. Uh, the very same agreements that come to this council constantly uh, for uh, revocation. Um, it, is, it is sad. Lord Mayor, I, I understand that the administration will seek to discredit everything that I say after I do. Um, no, I understand that. That's the way it works at this council. But this is a disappointment. It truly is. Uh, we should have, if we were going to do this, done it long before the demolition process began, long before we signed the document agreeing to sell that site. Members, Councillor Hyde. Um, I just want to just pick up on one point. Councillor Martin refers to the majority of the community being opposed to this. Of course, I know the consultation there were a total of seven submissions received in response to the public consultation. So I'm not sure which majority of the community Councillor Martin is talking to. But when I look at this, I look at it in the context of the broader $450 million development there on King William Street. I look at it in the context of the many, many hundreds of jobs that will be created. Um, uh, and you know, I wonder if we'd ask those people you know, what they think of this, whether we should hold up this project and try and drag it out, uh, putting more onerous requirements on Charter Hall before they start their, before they start their construction. And of course, I note as well, all the people that are served by Centrelink and Services Australia, who will be served by this new building as well. Um, uh, many, 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 you know, hundreds of thousands of people in South Australia will be served by the relocation of Services SA into this brand new fantastic facility. And I commend you, Lord Mayor, for joining, um, uh, you know, for joining uh, those who are present for the sod term of this building. It is a very, very exciting um, uh, project to have it on King William Street. Um, at the same time that we're complaining that there are rundown shop fronts and uh, and what have you, and begging and, uh, the, our landlords down there and property owners to do more to clean up their properties. Well, this is this is a development that will deliver a fantastic streetscape view of it. So, um, when I look at this project, I don't uh, I don't oppose it on the basis of a majority of the community, um, which is seven people um, who are perhaps not supportive of it. And I know that Councillor Moran, in her address when this last came up, said that she wouldn't use the toilets anyway. Um, uh, because they're, they're back then down there in a back alley and, uh, and possibly unsafe. So you know, I think I think we're going to get toilets. They're going to be there for the community. Uh, those people who are objecting to this will still be able to use those toilets. That's at the end of construction. This is a fantastic project. We should be applauding them, not trying to hold them up. Members. Oh, question. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, I think that's completely erroneous, um, much as I enjoy listening to Councillor Hyde. Nobody is suggesting that we are against the project at all. What we, suggest, what we were saying is that we wanted the, the toilets to remain in public hands because then we had total control over them. 
And in my experience, when private business takes it, they do put them right at the back, like the ones in the other part of Southern Cross. They don't put them on the street frontage. Only a, a public municipality like us puts it on the street because that is the most valuable land that building has. So it's only when a council or government owns toilets that they appear there. Uh, there are other toilets there, and I agree with um, Councillor Hyde. I have said I, I did go there once to little toilets hidden away, and there were three drug dealers going on, and a woman vomiting over the floor, <coughs> and a man who thought it was a, fe a fe male toilet. So no, I will not go into toilets that don't come off public thoroughfares. And Councillor Hyde might sneer at seven people. There are people that bothered to actually answer that. It's obviously not statistically significant, so we can't make any uh, substantive decision on those numbers. However, it's an indication. I think this is a great shame. Uh, public toilets, as people that live in the city know, are, for, are hard to find. Um, and you usually have to, as an, with an ageing population, it will become more of a problem. Uh, restaurants, cafes, and so forth are uh, becoming quite snippy about using their facilities unless you buy something there. And I think that's reflected because our public toilets have become hard to find. The ones that are uh, in the public, uh, private areas, as I said in the southern part, are dangerous and I wouldn't go there and I wouldn't take children there. The best toilets in the city of Adelaide are ours on James Place. And I will bet you any amount of money that they will disappear off the street front because that is the expense, that is the land eventually. That is the land that the building owner finds most valuable. The last thing he wants to do is put some toilets there unless he charges. They're not making any money, are they? They're a bit unsightly. They're, they're something he doesn't want there. They will disappear. And it is a shame that we have left it so late in the piece. And as for irritating the developer, don't you think that this council irritated the developer more by insisting that they had to conserve a heritage building? So irritating the developer clearly the Lord Mayor doesn't mind, I didn't mind, but keeping public toilets public and safe is a very important thing for a public municipality such as ours. This is, it, this is a shame. Councillor Martin, you had a question, and then I've got Councillor Mackey. Yeah, just a quick question, Lord Mayor. Um, could the administration advise of when, and I ask the question based on personal knowledge, when will explain to the city volunteers the new arrangements? Um, there does not seem to be any knowledge among volunteers about the status of the toilets. Oh, I can see. Uh, thank you, I'll take that on notice. Um, I would imagine that that would be part of normal briefings to our volunteers as well as our customer centre staff to make sure that they are aware of what's happening. Uh, Councillor Mackey, did you wish to speak? Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. A quick question and then just a very, very brief comment um, uh, through you, Lord Mayor, to the administration. Under the covenant that's been signed, are we guaranteed that there will be James Place direct access to the public toilets? Acting CE. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, Tom. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In response to the question, the access is done in a new urban laneway which connects King William Street into James Place. So it actually is a major thoroughfare that's been developed. Yeah. Correct. Right. Um, thank you. Um, uh, 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 Tom, uh, Lord Mayor, um, all, all I wish to contribute to this is to encourage uh, my fellow elected members and you to uh, go and find a copy of L.P. Hartley's novel um, called Closhmurl. And um, I'm reminded that uh, uh, there have been times when others, not in this chamber, but others have referred to our fair city as Closhmurl on Torrens. Members, <laughs> actually, I well, sorry, but as a standard, when you are actually debating a motion before you, you are supposed to say, I'm speaking in favour, I'm, I'm speaking sorry. against. Okay, I'm speaking in favour. Thank I'm you, sorry. Councillor Mackey. And I'd just like to bring back the focus of the debate being the motion before us. Um, members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Division. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour, please stand and remain standing. The name has been called. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Canole, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Ho, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Abrahamstone, and Councillor Kira. Members, that brings us to a close of our special council meeting tonight.
Um, I will uh, suggest that we do have a five minute break before we go into committee. Thank you, members.
committee members. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their culture, heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that, we are, are, that they are of a continuing, continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Members, we have two presentations tonight um, and a workshop, so please feel free to ask questions um, as this is a dis uh, just a treaty discussion forum. Um, 3.1, we have Theo Maris and Jody presenting in regards to the draft business plan and budget for ACMA. Thank you, Theo. Thank you and good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to present ACMA's draft business plan and budget. 2021-22. Four reports are taken as read, and I, have, and, I, and I will provide a brief overview. One, strategic plan. The vision of the Adelaide Central Market is to be the world's leading food and produce market. That has always been a target, and uh, it's something that we take very, very seriously, and something that we will continue with great passion and vigour. The mission of the authority is to operate sustainably and successfully as a group um, of prosperous traders, board and management team that will provide a diverse and exciting cultural shopping experience and enhance our precinct, city and state. Business plan. This is the fourth year of delivery of the 2018-22 Adelaide Central Market Strategic Plan. And the business plan outlines how the final year actions will be achieved. Budget. All actions have been budgeted for. The budget and business plan are based on the existing ACMA Foundation document. ACMA is currently working with the City of Adelaide Administration to provide updated version, fit for purpose foundation document, and if they approve, if if they are approved, it will also be able to focus on a one market strategy. Um, it's been six months that I've been at the market. It's been an exciting six months. I think, from my perspective, um, it's been a pleasure, an honour. And I must say that there's a lot that's been achieved. I think that the mere fact that we're proceeding heavily um, with a curation plan to tenant what was originally vacant areas and we're succeeding um, is something that has been very rewarding. And I must say that as we go on, the future plans are becoming exciting and it's actually drawing a lot of attention um, to that portion of the city, but in particular, strengthening the views um, of the public towards the market. I think that um, going forward, we're going to have a very, very exciting period and a lot will be achieved in that time before the opening um, of the new market as a whole. Um, so I, I won't run through um, all of our uh, business plan, we'll, we'll take it um, as, as read. Um, as Theo mentioned, this is the fourth year of our strategic plan um, and then there is a draft um, map moving forward through to 2024. As uh, Theo mentioned, he's been on board since August last year along with three new directors. Um, so we are starting to look forward um, into what the next few years will look like. Um, but our current strategic, strategic priorities are um, as per our current strategic plan. Um, so I'll, I'll take them as read and happy to answer any questions. Um, but our budget at 21-22 is based on uh, the current foundation documents. Um, and uh, the position that we're putting forward for our operating budget cash position for 21-22 uh, is $3.1 million. 
This is a surplus of $3.1 million. Uh, and then, of course, we pay uh, head lease and part management fees, $3.2 million. Uh, we have $200,000 worth of arcade redevelopment priorities, um, giving us the bottom line of our cash position um, of an operating cash deficit of, of 326000 so this position takes into account um, our current our current position in the market, coming off the back of a, of a pandemic and a, and a fairly tough year. Um, but as Theo mentioned, we actually have been able to attract um, a number of new tenants uh, in recent months. Um, we currently have two vacancies and have got a lot of interest in those spaces, and that's more around uh, curating who will go in there. Um, as opposed to, you know, we have a lot of interest, but we just need to put the right, right people in the right spaces. Um, and this budget also allows for the fact that, that we will be uh, potentially losing 260 car parks um, from October, um, which will reduce our uh, income um, by 660,000. So it is a, um, a slight deficit after you take into account all of that. And of course, as usual, we'll be pushing hard to, to bring that um, into a into a um, break even position if we can uh, in 21 22. Uh, the capital works that we're putting forward uh, for 21 22 is $1.2 million. Um, a significant portion of that is in relation to stall um, upgrade works. So these are all stall works of, of just replacement stalls that have been in the market for a long period of time. Obviously, the market's 150 years old. Um, we have some infrastructure that is, is getting quite old and as we get commercial leases and new leases if existing structures need to come down we will replace them and that's what the eight hundred thousand dollars is for and the other main one there is if we need to do structural war, um, works to reinforce federal halls floor um, to put storage or commercial uses in that space um, so that forms a bulk of the budget that we're requesting for capital works for 2021 22. Not anyone's got any questions? Any questions? Councilman? Um, thanks, Chair. Um, one question through you, Chair, um, to our guests, and the other question is probably something best uh, asked through you to uh, our administration, and it's just a little bit of historical catch up for, for me. Um, uh, firstly, through you um, to um, our guests, uh, under our infrastructure uh, and the strategic priority car park experience plan, and I'm, I'm not being tongue in cheek, but I'm just, I'm just keen to understand what, what is car park experience? Through the chair. Um, so we do have a car park experience plan. It, it does sound, you know, a little bit, a bit wordy. Um, but our understanding is that, uh, you know, the car park forms like a critical part of what makes the, the market function. Um, and the experience that customers have on arrival, on finding a park and exiting the park are all really important elements of the, of the market experience. Um, so we, we have a plan that the, that the board helped put together that we, we've shared with both New Park and um, the arcade development team um, to make sure that our customers um, have a positive experience when they come to shop at the market. So Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Look, so much. Just on that, I think that's a very important question and I'd like to add a little bit to that. Um, Adelaide and the Adelaide people have been spoiled by car parks and car parking in most commercial centres. And I think that everybody thinks about what they're going to do when they arrive at a destination. I would like to think that um, we make it as easy as possible, not only in the car park, but to get in and out of the car park. If we want the market to be successful and if you want the city um, to thrive on the basis of the market, People cannot think twice about coming in and going out of the market, so that is very important. Also, um, the market must provide safe parking. Um, you can't have people uh, walking around delinquently types of, and frightening the customers that are there, which does happen from time to time, unfortunately, because we are in the city. Uh, the other thing is, of course, that um, 
whilst we've got a construction period going on, um, we're talking about concierge. And we're talking about a concierge that's going to have volunteers or paid people to take product from the ground floor up to their cars and put it in the boot and say thank you very much in a polite manner. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate the context. And um, Chair, through you, probably a question more for the uh, administration. And again, a little bit of catch up for me, uh, given a, an 18 year uh, absence. Um, rent, uh, under budget assumptions, um, through you, Chair, um, the rent payable to the City of Adelaide is calculated at 30% of gross revenue, and the ACMA Charter uh, is currently under review. I'm just interested to get a little bit more insight into what is the policy rationale for um, that particular percentage of gross and not uh, you know, 25 or 35 or, or for whatever. Um, uh, thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, we do have Tom McCree here, so if you want a bit more uh, detail around the rationale of that, that was established uh, when the subsidiary was established some time ago, Councillor. Through you, presiding member, thank you for the question. The 30% was originally uh, brought together in regards to going out to market to test what a fair market rental would be for a facility of that nature. However, as part of the review of the charter, we will be assessing all associated costs. Um, we always test it against market. Um, so we will come back when it comes to the revised draft charter for consideration, but it was originally based on market research and market testing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any questions? Councillor Martin. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. The, um, it, may I ask if we can go back to the, um, the previous slide showing the budget consideration and um, particularly to the line to car parking. Um, it, it's showing um, that income from car parking will increase by 10%, but on the other hand, uh, you're saying from October there'll be a $600,000 hit to the bottom line. Does that mean that it would have been a million dollars higher under your plans had there not been that closure that's anticipated in October? Have I misread the figures? Um, through, the, through the chair. Um, so there's, there's a number of dynamics happening within, within the car park revenue. Um, we are expecting um, revenue to recover to 90% of pre-COVID. Um, and yes, we are losing 260 bags, which will reduce, potentially reduce um, revenue based on the modelling um, if those bays are taken away from October, noting separately those bays will be available across the road for that separate to, to revenue. Um, but we are also introducing um, a tariff for, um, from the 1st of July, um, which will be $2 for the first hour. So the first hour is currently free. Um, however, if you join up as a market lovers new park um, with that card, then you still will get the first hour free as a market shopper. Um, but because of that initiative, that does stay offset each other. Okay, uh, and what's just, sorry, I just want to make sure that we understand this issue. It's very important. I'm glad it's raised. At the moment, anybody can come along to the market, go in for the first hour and get it for free. What we're proposing to do is to do it in a way that the market shoppers or the market lovers are going into the market, the, one, the ones who do business in the market, and actually get the, the first hour for free. Uh, and yes, I know how it works. I use it all the time. Yes. Um, so you're anticipating this. There's quite a, a substantial gain to be had by uh, charging those punters who aren't doing the shopping at the market or prepared to sign up to the car. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Fine. Okay. And. Um, uh, that pretty much answers all of my questions except one to the administration. And I'm wondering if I could have a breakdown of the detail at page 17. Uh, it's just a broad brush, but it would be good just to understand in a bit more detail that information. Do I need to ask for that in writing or? Yeah. 
Uh, thank you through the chair. So, do you mean page 17, the operational project? Yeah, yeah, that'd be really good. Operation. Just to understand a bit more. I can take that on notice and I can talk to the general manager and chair. And thank you. They decide to, may decide not to, depending on what's underneath that. But I can round that back to you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. 3.2, we have the uh, draft business plan and budget uh, for the Adelaide Economic Development Agency for 2021-22. We have Nikki Govan and Ian Hill here to present. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and thank you to the elected members for your support to date in establishing the Adelaide Economic Development Agency, AIDA. The City of Adelaide 2020-2024 strategic plan highlighted the development and implementation of a citywide business model as a key strategic item action. Council resolved on the 6th of October 2020 to establish the Adelaide Economic Development Agency as a fully owned subsidiary of the City of Adelaide under Section 42 of the Local Government Act. On the 10th of November 2020, you approved my appointment as Chair and on the 15th of December, you approved the appointment of board members. And may I say how grateful I am for the appointment of the skills-based board members that you have appointed. They have a deep knowledge and understanding of the economic drivers for the City of Adelaide. AIDA commenced operating on the 18th of January 2021 and we are now located at Level 1 in Eagle Chambers, bringing together the key elements and staff from the Rundle Moor Management Authority, the Economic Development Unit of the City of Adelaide and the City of Adelaide Marketing Unit. And whilst we have only been operational for just over two months, we've been running at pace. In relation to the draft business plan and budget, we've undertaken a dedicated consultation process with key stakeholders from the business community, including industry leaders, key state strategic partners, precinct groups, as well as clearly from our board, our executive team, to form our inaugural draft business plan. The business plan will address how AIDA will support city and residential growth, visitor, uh, business growth, visitor growth, and citywide marketing in the 2021-22 financial year. Feedback from the business community has been overwhelming, positive to date, and we're looking forward to working as we can collaboratively to support the city in its recovery from COVID to stimulate future growth. I commend this plan to you, and I will now hand it over to Ian Hill, our Managing Director, to take you through key elements. Through the Chair, thank you, Chair. Uh, as uh, Nikki has said, we've been running at pace. We've been operating for about 45 working days uh, in AIDA. Um, we co-located staff, which is uh, a more efficient model for us too, which provides some savings from um, Rumble Mall rent and uh, visitor centre rent, which we can reinvest back into programs. So we're trying to be more efficient from day one. Um, probably the key point I'd like to make to the elected body is the process that we've gone through to get to where we are today around our business plan in the past. <coughs> Um, I think our administration, um, which I was obviously part, um, we would go through an internal process, put up um, budget bids and then come to you through an integrated business plan. Um, what we have done slightly differently through ADA is we've asked over 50 businesses, stakeholders, clients prior to a business plan for their input first. So we've actually, rather than present a business plan and ask for their feedback, we've actually asked for what they would like to see um, reflected in the business plan. Um, the types of groups included in that, uh, festivals, uh, events, organisers, Adelaide Convention Euro, Study Adelaide, um, Renew Adelaide, um, Renew SA, the South Australian Tourism Commission, um, all of the precinct groups. Um, so a fairly a broad church of, of people who have an interest in AIDA. Um, we asked them for their five biggest challenges for the city and their five um, biggest opportunities for the city. and. And that's now reflected um, and consistent with um, conversations with the board into what we see as being um, uh, within our business plan. Um, distilling that down simply, it really is about attract, stay, enjoy and spend in the city. Um, there's some key principles in there and that's broken down on that wheel as you see on the chart up there. 
um, into different sort of um, segments that we will focus on as an organisation. There's a fair amount of detail in the pack, there's a fair amount of budget breakdown too, um, but in summary, uh, total annual operating budget is $12.5 million. That includes the Rumble Mall levy and the concessions that they raise, that's inclusive. Um, the appropriation from council as it stands at the moment is $8.1 million, um, which is about 4% of um, the City of Adelaide's total budget. Um, FTE, just so you're aware, FTE is 31 um, FTE for the AIDA, which includes um, one of the more staff that came over and um, joined the AIDA. And that's again about 4.4% of um, Adelaide, City of Adelaide's total FTE. So we, um, we've done some work and I know I'd like to acknowledge Joe too in, in bringing the number more staff over. There's been some, again, some efficiencies there. We've gone from 10.8 to 10.6 to 8.4 FTE um, because there are some opportunities to leverage the skill sets that sit within AIDA. So we are about trying to be lean, lean, efficient, responsive, reactive um, to opportunities in the marketplace. We are not a policy unit. We are, we're a program delivery unit. And so we want to be able to adapt to opportunities that pop up in the marketplace. Um, we have got running, um, not so much this business bank, but so you've got some insight into what we are doing. Um, the Adelaide Long Lunch, which you may well have seen, 46,500 South Australians uh, registered to be part of that on day one, every 2.3 seconds, the South Australians signed up to be part of it. Um, and about 120 businesses who are registered and are now in that redemption phase where you can use a QR code to get $30 back from a restaurant, cafe, pub, or an experience, which could be something like the Adelaide Zoo. So that runs through March and April, and we'll provide an update back to the elected body and the board uh, on the success um, and the learnings from, from that program. Hopefully that gives you some idea of the types of things that we want to be able to do to stimulate visitation to the city, uh, expenditure in the city. Um, and we are certainly taking a city-wide approach to, to our programs. So happy to take questions and thank you. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, and thanks very much for the report. Um, and um, I am already on record as um, very positively inclined and wishing success to the Adelaide Economic Development Agency initiative of this council. Um, on page 26 of the council papers, visitor growth, this is just a quick one to um, easily be clarified, uh, under uh, outcomes to deliver new events, activations and experiences that bring people into the city. I'm just interested to clarify the extent to which AIDA's focus will be overlapping with SA Tourism's focus, which is predominantly on bed nights versus uh, punters coming into the city. Um, would you like to answer them one by one? I think it's probably, is that okay, Chair? Back to the chair. Um, one of the first things that the chair and I are doing is meeting with uh, Rodney Harris, the CEO of SATC, and their chair, Andrew Bullock. Um, so we're, we're going to have a, a conversation there about what a joined up um, slash MAU slash agreement partnership starts to look like. So that's something that's, that's strategic intent from us and the board and Nikki. From an operation perspective, um, I think there'll be gaps that the SATC will obviously look at those what are called big major events, the blockbuster type things that are high cost, relatively high impact, but they do focus a lot on bed nights. Um, I think we will be a slightly broader uh, scope than that in terms of things that bring the city to life. Um, it won't be so much about international events either because they come with a very big price tag. Um, so it would have been a good example of that. You know, high cost event, global event, big audience, it's not something that's basically playing. Um, but there are, there are significant opportunities to develop uh, a more sophisticated 12 to 18 month rolling calendar events that support the city and, and the businesses. Thank you. Through the Chair, if I could just add to that, um, Councillor Mackey, as you may be aware, I chair the Premier's event advisory um, group and uh, we are making recommendations to the South Australian Tourism Commission about doing a better spread of events in terms of the funds that uh, have been quoted by the Premier of North of 12 million. Um, and I think it's fair to say, certainly with this hat on, that without doubt that our focus is going to be very, very strongly in the city and North Adelaide area. So I think it really will complement the amount of funds that are in the AIDA budget. Um, utilising what is going to be available at a much greater level from the state government's budget. Um, 
Thank you, through you, Chair. Thanks, Nikki and Ian. Um, on page 27, under brand and marketing, uh, to position Adelaide as the most livable city in the world, um, under a create, under the outcomes, you've got this to create digitally led campaigns and platforms. Uh, just a question uh, that may sound obtuse, but is this an outcome or is it more a tool toward an outcome? Um, um, to the Chair, about fair questions, we've got to both, to be honest. Um, we, we've obviously talked a bit about metrics and KPIs within the organisation. We're 45 days young, um, so we're looking for, for metrics that A, we can achieve with the budget that we've got. Um, but I'll take the points. It's probably more of a uh, later part of the form. Yeah. Um, um, thanks, Ian. And again, through you, uh, Chair. Um, on the same page, uh, I'm, and I'm really pleased to see uh, 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 under strategies to further develop a customer relationship or CRM tool. Just a question again through you, Chair. Do we have a CRM product that um, uh, you've picked up um, through either Rumble Mall Authority or, or another? Historically, no. We've been a bit more, dare I say, Excel spreadsheet lead. Um, there's some work with um, Mall do have some CRM material, but also working with IM and our IM department and City of Adelaide have got uh, a base model and we're working with them what that starts to look like. It could be tailored for use by a so there are a couple of things that are live to, to help us. Thanks, Ian. And again, through you, Chair, on page 31 under AIDA expenditure, and this is a question I'm happy to have taken on notice. Uh, under uh, resource costs, including Rundle Mall, um, would it be possible to just get a bit of more of a breakdown of that? I'm just I'm just interested in the Rundle Mall component versus other components, and then further down that page, Rundle Mall marketing and events. I would be also grateful to understand what that breakdown between Rumble marketing and the events that are, of course, a part of marketing, but they're a discrete cost centre against that 2.764777 million. And um, uh, page 36, um, through you, Chair, um, under AIDA brand and marketing, and I, I suspect it's something that's been mashed uh, together. It, it, as I read this, it looks as though AIDA is going to spend 409000 promoting AIDA. But I think on this, that, that's a too literal an interpretation, so I'd just be grateful for a uh, uh, clarification. Um, through the chair, yes, we can provide those back. Thank you. Councillor Martin? Yes, Chair, can I ask a couple of questions? Certainly Thank can, that's what the, tonight's about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, look, uh, can I just say, Aida is one of my favourite operas. Um, I hope you are too. <laughs> um, but look, just to touch on a, a couple of things that were mentioned, um, uh, you talked about a dialogue with FreeSync groups. Um, uh, have you undertaken within these budget figures um, uh, any consultation with them about funding, which has hitherto rested with council? <laughs> through, the, through the chair, in this budget, we've made provisional allocation for the 25,000 times seven precinct groups, which is the existing um, support that's, that's provided to precinct groups. We've also engaged with them um, in the formation of our business plan, so they've all been invited. And those that couldn't make it, we did follow up with an online survey to get their input, um, which has been great, really warmly received. And the other piece of work that we're doing that includes dedicated work with the precinct groups is the terms of reference for the advisory committee to nominate someone to the board. So they will, no, you're okay. they, they, they will be part of that process, councillor. Okay. And also, there's no visitor centre anymore. Is there some strategy to create one outside of your history? So through the chair, um, there is a visitor centre. It's now co-located with our customer centre down on just off Peary Street. And the rationale for that move is obviously it's a construction zone um, in James Place at the moment, so it's not particularly a hospitable place for, for visitors to find information. So we've co-located into a brighter area through the breezeway point, um, really well, really well received by the volunteers. 
um, my understanding of some of the initial feedback from visitors going through is um, they managed to find it very easily. I think most of them were on the phone and managed to find it. We've changed some of the signage around the city so you can see um, some just general signage to this visitor centre. It's co-located, it's light, it's airy, it's got more space than the previous centre. Um, so the brochures, displays and the sort of software is, I would suggest, it be better than it was before, but we still have aspirations for a more state-of-the-art centre uh, in CBD, which is, will be a subject to further consultation with the elected body. Oh, great. Good. Good news. Um, and Chair, um, if I could ask the administration further to Councillor Mackey's request, if I can have the figures uh, that stand behind those mentioned on pages 31, 32, 33, 34, 35 and 36, that would help me enormously to understand. But I'd also like to see, as Councillor Mackey does, um, the specific expenditure for Rundle Mall. That would be really useful. Uh, thank you for the chair. Yes, yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hyde. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, first off, I want to thank our guests for coming in. Um, uh, it's really good. I'm really, really impressed to see what the agency has been doing um, so far, and particularly uh, the result of the motion that we brought in in December, I think, um, uh, to allocate some resources from Carry Forward um, through to AIDA. Um, uh, I think I think everything seems to be going well in that regard. I want to commend them on their rollout for that in, in such a quick way. Um, uh, w one thing, just by way of feedback, um, when, when we originally drafted the charter, one of the things we built into it was some increased accountability over and above what RMMA and I suppose ACMA as well um, were traditionally obliged to do. Um, it, 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 it's my firm view that we should be presented with, at least in link form, the same budgets that the board, accepting any commercial and confidence stuff, or if in link form with that, um, we should be for accountability's sake. And that was one of the key gripes that traders and Ronald Mall had with me. It was that. A, a lack of a lack of regular accountability, and that's just because the board sits outside of the democratic, um, you know, structure that the council is in, where you meet regularly, you can put questions on notice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I would just I would just urge strongly urge through you, chair um, that level of detail to come through the council as well, um, uh, because I think given given the the, the, the magnitude of of the organisation's role. Um, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to, to sort of cast that fine eye over. Um, uh, and with that, probably my questions that I have probably would have been answered by, by the provision of those instead of just headline um, sort of figures. But um, regarding Rundlemore marketing and events um, and the Rundlemore operations, there was, I understood in the charter that we had it so that everything from collected from the levy would then go back to Rundle Hall, but I think it's 3.8 collected through the levy, but in those two lines, 2.7 and seven uh, and 600,000 respectively, is that how is how is the agency working through that that issue of sort of having a hypothecated funding on the one hand, um, but then still delivering for Rundle Hall per sort of what the charter was intended at? In. Uh, through the chair, thank you for the question. Uh, essentially, it's ring fenced and telling within ADA, so that there's 3.8 collected through the levy, and there's about 600,000 through concessions raised through the mall. Um, so that money is ring fenced to be reinvested back into the Rundle Mall activations, marketing, and promotions. Yeah, but uh, sorry, I, I suppose I suppose the point was that 2.7 and, and 600,000 that doesn't add up to 3.8. So I, I guess are there are there other parts of I think, I think it's, sorry, back through the chair because there's a um, resourcing component that just sits in a jungle budget. Right, that's what I was saying. Oh, okay, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. and just for, for for the sake of those, for the sake of those businesses around the mall who had complained to me when when the merge happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I think it would just be good in future. And this is why I guess want that level of detail so that they can see their if you split out resourcing, you just put it there in that that expenditure. Um, uh, slide. And um, I guess also as a result of the accountability regime that we put in place, Chair, um, AIDA will be coming to us in a, on a quarterly basis. Is that, is that correct? So, yes. not, right. not that we want to harass you, but again, it's an important, very important role that, that AIDA are undertaking. So yeah. I guess we'll through this in three months. Uh, thank you. Just through the Chair, if I could just draw your attention, Councillor, to slide 32. It does 
clearly show the quarantine for random all income and expenditure there. So is it more detail you wanted or are you comfortable with that? Sorry, I was just going to that's usually how um, members would have seen it in the past. Give me a moment to digest it, but I, I stand by my original point that I actually want to see what's behind the figures. Um, I want to see, you know, I, I want to understand the sort of programs that A is delivering uh, and that sort of thing. So that's, and then it, more to the point as well, the people that are relying on us to get this right, right business model right are relying on council to have adequate oversight. And that was one of the things that was really big in my consultation on the draft charter and the, then the charter that was that was endorsed. So I just want to make that clear. Um, but no, that does that does probably answer my question. So thank you for drawing my attention to it. Um, and, and thank you. So in terms of reporting back, um, it was always very clear during the consultation and um, any engagement from the administration's perspective that um, setting KPIs which would be um, part of the strategic planning and the um, annual planning that the agency undertakes along with ACMA, um, that that is the role of council to monitor and oversee those KPIs. And obviously, as Ian and uh, the chair have already indicated, that work is being fast-tracked as quick as possible. And I'm sure we'll come back in at some point um, into the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Happy to provide that level of information and detail that's been requested by the councillors and look forward to reporting back quarterly. May not be an operatic performance, Councillor, but uh, I can promise that we will um, look forward to that quarterly Happy reporting. Happy Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, Councillor. Exactly. Oh. Um, just through you, Chair. Uh, now, just in regards, uh, 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 with regards to the uh, Precinct groups, etc. Uh, is there a, is there any idea at this point uh, on how the relationship will work, no, other than uh, getting allocation of twenty five thousand um, dollars, and also the representation, uh, you know, to uh, to the to, to the board through the administration, and or is that going to go via, um, you know, the, the advisory group? Um, back to the chair. There's been some um, really constructive discussions, I think, amongst our executive and the board about a, a slightly different approach with present groups. So yes, the funding has been allocated, but it's more about capability and capacity building. And so that how we how we um, encourage or support um, some of the the commonalities that are across the present groups. For example, there's no intranet page where they can all access the things that the opportunities that Ada may be providing for them to either buy into or leverage off. Uh, they've all got newsletters, but can we move them to more EDM based and help them with simple design uh, rather than cost for them? Can we help them with distribution of those newsletters? Can we help them with them becoming more, a bit more digitally savvy? So there's some different thinking going on within the organisation about how we can support and build capability and capacity. That's a different conversation to being just giving our money. And to your second question, um, I think I've covered that a little bit earlier by saying we're actively engaged with the precinct groups about how they participate in the advisory committee of which the terms of reference are coming back to council for approval. Thank you. Councillor Kira. Thanks, Chair. Through you, um, I'll just do one question tonight. I might send some others uh, by email. Um, but what comes up to me tonight is uh, just looking at the visitor growth um, page and the figure of 2.7 million on sponsorship and city stimulus events. Um, is there a, a recognition or is there a real cognizance within IDEDA that there may be a serious, um, you've got a Venn diagram, serious difference between uh, visitors who comprise uh, event visitors, um, that is hospitality based festivals and events of that sort, uh, as opposed to visitors who come uh, and might uh, purchase goods and services from city businesses who are not related to uh, events, have no real connection to events, and who, in fact, uh, sometimes may feel that events uh, don't particularly help them very much because a lot of roads are blocked off and there's a sense that there's a lack of accessibility. Um, is this distinction, you know, is there real cognizance about this distinction? And will there, can you assure us that there will be some uh, real 
focus on on those two separate cohorts, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yes, the chair. So that two point seven you refer to about one point seven. That is mostly under contract. So it's been things that the past uh, the body has supported. So the Fringe, Wyman, Adelaide Festival, Feast, Sala, Children Under, Taste in Australia, Oz Asia Festival. Those big list of events. They definitely do drive foot traffic. Uh, you talk to the event and the success they've had with Fringe just in the last uh, month or so. Um, we, we're certainly cognizant and keen to make sure that those those benefits are spread more broadly across the city. Um, there's also an appropriation through council just recently for another million dollars for to grow existing events and to attract some new events. So we will look at um, how those things drive, spend, stay, enjoy within the city. I take your point about um, retail and making sure those things support retail don't hinder retail um, and one of the other focuses will be uh, which has been a little bit different to in the past is city workers so city workers how we get them to stay longer spend more particularly with the covid change of more flexible working from home arrangements if that, if that day is a friday or a thursday working from home um, i'm trying to get a bit more data on that so that's a thursday or friday that's secondary spend day that's when people do spend on retail um, so we want that expenditure in the city not in for due respect, I mean, Prospect or Burnside or um, Marion or, or wherever. Just to follow. Yeah. Just, just to follow up on that, um, and thank you for that. I um, thank the administration for you for that. Um, but just coming back to that distinction and uh, looking at uh, the distinction between retail and hospitality and perhaps services. So I'm thinking you're maybe a sole practitioner, accountant, mm -hmm. or sole practitioner, psychologist, or all those, that suite of uh, the economy. Um, will there be a cognizance as well? I suppose uh, looking at we, what we're looking at here is umbrella, a lot of umbrella advertising for the city uh, in general, uh, in lieu of um, money that could go back to businesses in the form of rate reductions. They will quite rightly saying, look, um, what are the results that we get from this umbrella advertising that we couldn't get with a bit of Facebook advertising for the, you know, a few hundred bucks per year we, we might get a return. It's a legitimate question as councils, we've, we've got to face that question. Um, is, is there, again, is there a, a cognizance when it comes to uh, the marketing and is there perhaps a, um, can you give us an assurance that there will be a, a, a drive to be brutally effective in the marketing not to perhaps fall prey uh, to, I guess I can't really put it the other way, but you know, you sort of soft marketing campaigns that are sort of hipster focused and all a bit kind of, you know, wishy washy, and you, you know the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Um, no, is there? No, 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 no. People who people who actually uh, engage in the real world do. Uh, and, uh, people who run businesses, people who run businesses certainly, certainly do. It's people who run businesses certainly know what I'm talking about. So, we're, we're, is there is there cognizance, and, and can you assure us there will be a, a sort of a real effectiveness that we focus on uh, accessibility on the, on the bread and butter and nuts and bolts aspects uh, of the city, alongside all of the sort of um, lifestyle stuff? Again, uh, through the chair. Yes, I might just use a, again a really simple live example. The, the long lunch campaign is. There was basically no advertising money spent. It was actually done through a bit of PR, a bit of Facebook, a bit of um, getting operators to get out and spread the word. So most of that money has gone straight back into the $30 voucher. So I think it's not a particularly complex execution. Um, I wouldn't call it wishy-washy. I don't know. I wasn't criticising what has been done. I, I, in no way was I criticising what has been done, my yeah. uh, like, no, 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 no. I didn't take it as a criticism. No, no, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about generic stuff. When you see cities being advertised in yeah. general elsewhere, um, you can get that sort of, you know, those sort of lifestyle ads. That, that's what I'm talking about, not, not what A has done so far. Yeah, the ball of yarn. The, 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 the ball of yarn. The the ball of yarn. The ball that's that's you know, sort of history well, through Melbourne. Um, through the chair, um, there's, apart from the very good team on the executive, um, I've probably spent about 20 or 30 years in tourism and destination marketing interstate and overseas. And I think what's really important is for us to look at the different demographics which in uh, in each of those market segments. So whether we're talking about business investment growth or whether we're talking about tourism growth, event marketing it, uh, and residential growth, they're all going to have to have different um, market segments and different programs that are going to be attracting those. So take your point and I think you can be assured that there is a very good group of people with experience that can make sure that we can address that concern you might have. <coughs> 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. I think we might move on. Um, and if you've got any other questions, can you please um, feel free to uh, email and uh, to Nikki or to Ian? Thank you. Um, members, we are now um, entering into a workshop in regards to the business plan and budget and strategic projects and infrastructure. Uh, Grace Hell will be presenting to you. Uh, Justin is going to start off. But members, I just want to make a point that uh, we are, this is a st strategic discussion. Your input is, input is valued. So I'll uh, please keep it uh, two questions and any queries that you have from the papers in front of you. Do you want the questions then? And respond to the quick questions. Thank uh, you, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Um, we last presented to you on the 23rd of uh, February. Uh, in summary, we listened. We listened a lot. Uh, and we took on board the feedback that was given. Uh, while working internally, uh, we, we've been able to find other uh, issues and, and things that we need to understand better, and uh, we've improved our position since, since then. We uh, presented a reasonably cha challenging prospect in terms of the budget that was there and the uh, ability to reduce that debt very quickly. And some of those things were unfortunately out of bounds. You made that quite clear, and it probably uh, was stated that it made our life easier, but uh, not necessarily yours. And so we've taken on back, back on board that feedback as well. You definitely wanted to support ratepayers. Uh, we get that. You didn't want to pass on the burden of COVID-19 and the global pandemic to them, uh, so that they bear the brunt. Uh, it was stated that uh, council saw that as its role in terms of cushioning the pain. So we he heard you on that front. Uh, you also wanted to stimulate economic activity rather than to do things which which drive it the other way and it's easy to save costs and, and uh, not look after the income side of it or, or the activity side of things. You also acknowledged that visitors were needed in the city and that businesses were doing it tough, so we heard that. Um, what we heard was that there was no real appetite for, firstly, the uh, rates to increase, in the rate, rate in the dollar in particular. Um, reducing services or staff providing those services beyond what, we're, what we've been talking about. Uh, thirdly, cutting the operational activities, which is the events, the grants and programs. Or fourthly, the dramatic, a dramatic increase in fees and charges. Uh, so that would have been unacceptable as, as well. There was an appetite for additional parking revenue, which we've been looking at, and a relook at the asset maintenance and renewals programs. So that has been a, a key thing, which uh, some longer term work needs to be done as well to, to really unlock uh, some of the opportunities in that program, as well as the future fund. And that's something which uh, has received a lot of, lot of talk in terms of how that can be used much more effectively than it, than it currently is. So we've built tonight's presentation on your feedback, but we haven't got all the answers yet. I have to say that up front. Um, the budget is still a work in pro progress and it's not a baked cake. Um, we, we have a plan for a more gradual, a gradual climb out of the debt that you, you see um, to trade out of the de deficit which was, uh, which was men mentioned. So to smooth that pain and, and to take it over, over a couple of years um, rather than inflicting that pain that I talked about uh, earlier uh, on, on people, which it, which it will because there's, there's only so many opportunities that we can leave, leverage on. Um, and we also didn't put in, in the, and you would have seen this to, for, for transparency, we didn't plug in a, a, a automatic balancing figure uh, with no real science behind that. Uh, we, we didn't think that that was the right thing to do from an unknown, uh, unknown source. And we want to take a few months to actually look more at more sustainable targets and staff practices in, in particular, uh, and some education which will lift us out of this position in a longer term sense, but, but more thoroughly, uh, rather than just putting a band-aid over, over things. So there's some broad statements that I, I wanted to make, and uh, Grace will now unpack that, our, our uh, finance and uh, procurement manager, uh, who we're very lucky to have, I might add, and also ably assisted by Nicole, who has uh, uh, brought this through for a number of years. So, Grace, over to you. Thank you, Justin. Um, so, yeah, with, uh, with that preamble, I think we'll kind of 
Could we just move straight into, um, I guess, the draft budget and where it stands at this point in time? There are some key uh, points we'd like to go through tonight in terms of what the strategic projects have been allocated to um, and the um, new and up, um, significant upgrades and the renewal uh, budgets as well from a capital perspective. So really just trying to focus on those strategic projects and infrastructure projects tonight. Um, knowing that the allocation of those projects won't impact the deficit position that has been presented anyway. So um, when we are talking about capital upgrades and renewal, up, renewal of uh, capital and those balances, um, they will not impact their um, point. $18 million budget that is um, de de budgeted as a deficit at this point in time. So again, we'll just sort of touch on some of those um, comments that um, Justin has made. So in preparation of this budget, we've been trying to work towards the parameters that were issued back on the 15th of December. However, some of them are conflicting. So it is um, a, little, a little hard to actually try and meet one without um, not meeting another and, and um, that's the reality of where we're at at the moment. So what we try to do is present you with the most transparent position that we can to be able to say this is um, how the numbers are falling basically. So um, what's changed since the last time we presented to you in terms of those parameters? Those parameters had an assumption that um, the subsidiaries would break even. You've heard tonight through the ACMA presentation that their cash deficit is 326. The actual overall operating deficit from an accounting perspective is actually close to 1.2 million. So in the parameter that had a $100,000 deficit, um, that was at nil, that automatically turns us around by 1.2 on the bottom line. So um, again, that's um, one of those parameters that was set that unfortunately has changed since December and we're trying to work through that. Um, Likewise, there was an operational expenditure parameter as well, which again, trying to work towards, but um, again, there's a, there's a conflicting parameter in there around an operational target, which if we input that, we still wouldn't meet the expenditure target that was provided, provided as a parameter. So the decision was made to highlight that and show the fact that what we'll do is remove that item to be more transparent and show you what the actual result is. Um, that way you can make a decision about how we want to treat that going forward. We have, as Justin said, gone away and tried to do some more research into some of our costs and our income opportunities as the, the um, feedback was presented in the last workshop. And we have gone away and made sure that we've fulfilled our commitment of finding the $20 million permanent ongoing reduction to the operating expenditure, which when we were talking to you only a month ago, we were still $2 million short of that. Um, so we now have fulfilled that and actually found the remaining 20 million. Um, that has come through some cost savings and us looking, re-looking at some areas around um, legal expenses and um, some other cost savings and operational um, income opportunities. So we've put that through and we've met that $20 million as um, resolved by the council. As I said, um, in the last um, workshop, we did sort of talk to you about this additional $5.2 million expenditure target, but we have removed that um, on, the, on the basis that it does conflict with the overall parameter. So we try to present to you um, basically what is, I think, more uh, clearer and transparent financial position. Um, as uh, Justin has said, I think from a sustainability perspective, um, we are looking to sort of make more sustainable decisions as we're going forward. Um, having uh, expenditure targets without a sort of an idea as to where that volume of saving will come from without a significant impact on our service delivery um, is not necessarily a sustainable method at this point in time, not one um, that I guess recommend. So basically we, we kind of need that, that decision from council if, if that is the, the aim to kind of go that way. But um, at this point in time, looking to make sure we can trade out of this sustainably. So. That does mean that we will be presenting a um, draft budget that does have a deficit position for next year with the idea that that deficit will reduce over years. Um, keeping in mind that Council has um, come off of a global pandemic and being a capital city that's had to ride through that way. So um, I don't think it would be um, unachievable to, to expect us to trade out of that deficit over one or two years with the, with the magnitude of impact that we've had over the last two. So. Um, I'm just going to keep going for you can keep going, yeah. Um, so the strategic projects was um, a part of the parameters that we've tried to, to um, stick to throughout this uh, budget process. So $5.4 million was the 
um, target in, uh, that we're working towards. Um, we have allocated some of these uh, projects, or most of about five point four four million dollars. There is point four, so four hundred thousand that is um, unallocated at this stage that we're holding for emerging priorities. So that way we were able to respond should anything be presented by council or through council throughout the year. Um, in that COVID recovery environment. Um, but most of them are allocated out, most of that 5.4 is allocated out already. That list is those projects that have either already commenced this financial year and are still going, um, or there is some previous council commitment to them or contractual commitment to them. So we've tried to keep them as those that we are absolutely prioritising and committed to already um, and not kind of adding new things to the list. So um, we are staying within that. That's one budget program that we're staying within, so that's good. Um, one, um, another concept I suppose that I wanted to sort of take council through tonight is a little bit of a change with regards to looking at how we look at capital as a council. Um, I think from an annual budget perspective, we always sort of are locked into looking at annual budget figures, um, which I guess is it makes it clean and simple for a budget from a budget and an annual budget perspective in the sense that council is only delegated to approve a budget at an annual basis at a time. However, it is important that we have visibility over what a project is about. So this concept of whole of life is I think that is a new concept that I'm sort of bringing into to council and we'll be looking to um, increase the, the level of detail and reporting of over these projects and their delivery in concept of this whole of life delivery. So the best example I can give you with this, and, you, and um, you'll see in the appendices of the reading pack that was provided to you for tonight, um, is the um, central market redevelopment, where if we're talking about a budget allocation for that this year, I'd be talking to you about a $14 million budget allocation. The reality of it is, is that you've approved a $27 million budget allocation. So when we need to deliver this project, we should be talking to you about how we're delivering against the 27, not against $14 million of an annual budget. So whilst you can only approve an annual budget at a time, it is important that we are transparent with that in terms of that project delivery and showing you how those projects are actually performing against the project, the life of the project, and not just the, the singular budget that is approved. What that will do is focus on the project delivery. It will focus on the fact that some budgets will take, or some projects will take time to deliver and not necessarily be delivered within a financial year. Um, and it'll, it'll hopefully, I guess, return the focus to how are we delivering these projects? What projects do we have capacity to deliver? And therefore, continually look at that as opposed to this budget and then potentially a carryover budget and, and those sorts of things. So we'd like to kind of increase that transparency with council and with the public to be able to say, this is the project that's been approved. This is the budget that's been approved for the project. And we'll continually report on how that is being delivered. Um, so I wanted to just sort of tie back into our conversation from last um, workshop around funding pathways. Um, it is important that we understand that our assets budget in terms of renewals and new and significant upgrades and how they're funded. Um, so when we are talking about renewals, um, traditionally we like to sort of talk about that being funded out of cash flow from operations. So um, when we are looking at that value of renewals, we want to make sure that we're generating enough cash flow from our operations to be funding those renewals. Um, this year, we are presenting that as, as working out um, well because we've actually reduced the level of asset renewals already. So one of the budget parameters provided was that we we're going to um, renew our assets at a 67% sustainability ratio this year. So that's already been worked into this budget, which means we are actually going to generate enough from our cash flow operations to fund our renewals, i.e. we don't have to borrow for our renewals. We are therefore um, generating slightly more than from um, operations that is, going, that is planned then to spend on renewals. So that cash flow is helping us to fund the new projects that we're adding. So that's what that 11.23 million is talking about. And then the balance is basically being funded by new um, borrowings. So we're trying to, essentially the, the impact of reducing the capital program, the renewal program, is that you're opening up more cash flow to fund the renewal and um, therefore decreasing the amount of borrowings required for your new capital. Um, 
there's probably some more conversation around asset sustainability when um, it gets to sort of those decisions in the long term. We can save those for Matt when he comes up and, and talks to you about um, our renewal program. So this is just a breakdown of our upgrades, so new and significant upgrades um, planned. Again, this is the annual budget for this year, so I would encourage you to, to look at the, the appendices that were provided for you tonight to look at the whole project. As, as I said, um, the, the um, archive redevelopment in here is in here at 14.9 million, but you know, you're all aware that it's a much bigger budget than that, but in, included in this year's budget number will be the 14.9 million. Again, this is another parameter that was assigned um, to council in, um, sorry, by council on the 15th of December in terms of that um, $19.2 million uh, new and upgrades. Um, again, tried our best to sort of keep to those um, targets. The, 20, the current budget is, has a, um, a number in there of $20.58 million, which is again slightly higher than the parameter um, provided. Those with an asterisk next to them are those that we would suggest are not contractually um, obligated or by a council decision at this point in time and therefore are you variable um, and that would save you about a million dollars if we decided not to go ahead with those three projects. Um, and that would be a way to try and get it back to the original parameter. Um, should the council go there though. Um, I will say that if we did not decided not to do these ones because some of this is being funded by those, those surplus cash flow from operations, it wouldn't necessarily generate any impact to the $4.8 million um, bottom line if you did have to reduce this number. It, but it certainly would impact the borrowings. Uh, renewal and replacement. So um, this is your asset renewal. So again, budget parameter was set 27.6. Again, we've tried to work with that as much as we can. Um, outside of those things that again are not requiring um, uh, a replacement. So the total budget in the um, draft business plan budget at the moment is 33.1. It is a $5 million variance from what the parameter was set at. Um, the parameter again, as I was saying, is set at the 20, as at the 67% asset sustainability ratio. I know 5, point, uh, 5 million seems like a big um, variance from that, but in actual fact, off of a $1.4 billion asset budget, we're still at around 67% in terms of the asset sustainability ratio, even with the additional 5 million. So um, it does um, uh, make a difference, obviously, in terms of the dollars. But again, if we reduce this renewal budget, um, it will not impact the bottom line favourably either. So, at this point, unless there's any sort of questions from a budget perspective, I'm going to happily hand over to Matt. But yeah, no, I have a couple of questions, um, if I may, Chair. Sure, it's Matt. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm confused about the uh, the actual figures. Um, the deficit or the operating uh, deficit they're forecasting 325,000. That's correct. Uh, yes, Councillor, thank you, through the Chair. Yes, that's the cash deficit. Um, what the uh, City of Adelaide budget will represent is the impact on City of Adelaide, which has to include depreciation um, for the building that the central market operates out of, and that adds an additional approximately 800,000 to it. So the impact for the City of Adelaide is actually $1.2 million loss. And what about the uh, the capital works that are proposed? Don't they also go to our budget? Uh, thank you, through the chair. And um, the capital works are included in our capital program. So, in the you see the ACMA renewals number is there for the 865 from the renewals. And with regards to the new and enhanced upgrades, there is an ACMA budget included there of 380,000. And those two are added. Yeah. So that so they're both included in our capital budget for the city of Adelaide as well. So the total impact of ACMA on the council bottom lines, you know. Uh, capital doesn't go to the bottom line, so that's borrowings. Yep. Um, whereas the $1.2 million um, deficit is the impact on the operating bottom line. Yes. Okay. Um, and Chair, just a, a couple of other uh, quick questions. And can I just say I am grateful at page 44 that the administration has found those savings. That's great. Saves a lot of pain. Um, uh, am I correct in? reading these documents um, to come to the conclusion that our operating deficit the coming financial year has grown by about 10 percent since the last lot of figures came to us. Uh, thank you councillor through the chair. Uh, yes the reading pack that was provided to you 
last week or whenever the agenda went out. Um, unfortunately, didn't pick up the ACMA uh, variation. Um, we, we, in that pack, we were reporting a slightly different ACMA number. The board on the Thursday morning had approved a different number and we thought it would be best to present to you that number worked in with the new ACMA number tonight. And so we updated the presentation for that effect, just so you could see that that's the impact of the ACMA board decision on the Thursday. And additionally, uh, the borrowings that are forecast um, for 21-22, they have grown also. Uh, yes, Councillor, through the Chair, um, that's the direct result of the deficit budget that's been changed. And that's grown by, um, let me see, again about 10%. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, look, can I, I just ask, I mean, look, I, this is good. I'm really happy that it's easily read. I, it would be nice. Can you come up? Can you put the microphone on? Sure. Can't be heard with that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, uh, it would be nice if we. Um, disclose a bit more in uh, the statements, not least to uh, the public consultation. Um, it, it is relevant to disclose that our borrowings are pushed back out to a decade hence. Uh, I think that's really, really significant and something we ought to draw attention to. Um, and uh, you know, in whatever terms we want. Um, and also, uh, I think we ought to be emphasising that we are selling performing and non-performing assets in the information packs that are provided, uh, because we are, um, and, and it would be nice if we were That's just selling property in that long term financial Okay, yeah. Um, well, in, in, in this document, it's recounted in the principles, and you know, I'm just asking if we do that. Um, and yes, I have some comments on infrastructure. Happy to wait. Council Sims. Um, thanks, Chair. And look, I really want to thank um, the administration for the work on this. I can tell there's a lot of work um, that's been done, and, and obviously a lot of the feedback from previous workshops has been taken into consideration. Um, I'm just conscious of the uh, lateness of the um, hour, and I, I'm conscious we're about to get another. Um, presentation. I'm just wondering whether maybe, um, what isn't, wasn't there going to be another presentation on assets? It's, it's a quick review of the map. Yeah. It's not another oh, yeah. long, I don't no, know. It's it, it just, uh, I'm conscious that it's been a very long uh, night and I, I don't know about other members, but I think it is difficult to be able to give this the attention that it deserves in terms of proper discussion around the issues. Um, so I just want to put that out there um, that if we're going to move into a, another um, presentation, I'm, I'm worried about the quality of the feedback that might be received um, at this time, whether it's worth having another special session to talk about it in more detail. Well, Chancellor Martin. Oh, look, I'd just uh, I'd like to echo that because I, I understood also there was to be another discussion in relation to uh, infrastructure. And I, I particularly want to talk about how we're going to deal with what is now a surplus funds from the East West Bikeway, how that's going to impact on the infrastructure program. It might be nice if administration were able to go away and talk about that. And it, it might also uh, remove some of my anxiety uh, about pages 71 and 72. Um, well, I'm sure the CEO can help with your anxiety. What do you think? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Would the, you see, the acting CEO would be um, very concerned. Would you? About your anxiety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you all? Uh, would we have? Do we need a council to refer it yeah. or what? No, you can decide. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to sort of get a sense from everyone in the room, councillors, as um, the the fourth Tuesday we do try to devote from January through to consultation through to budget, and we've done that for the last couple of years. I understand that it is late, and it has been quite an emotionally draining night for many. So I'm sure that um, you're feeling it. But I'm keen to just perhaps chair get a sense from the room if you'd prefer to keep going. Um, obviously, any delays to this does really impact our timeframes, and we have statutory timeframes around consultation in particular. Um, and so, um, you know, other options can always be explored. But um, I, you know, could we could we Tuesday could we could we have that call next Tuesday? I don't think there's anything scheduled. 
Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, if we're adjourning, you need to go to a vote. If we're not adjourning, then we continue on. Can we please either vote or continue? No, no, sure. We need a motion yeah. to adjourn. Okay, ask for a motion. No, I'm not going to do a motion to adjourn. I just wanted to uh, test whether there was an appetite to do that. But, but if, if there's well, you can do that by motion uh, to see if there is an appetite. Yeah, oh, Councillor oh, Kerry, would you like to move the move motion? Yes. Uh, so, to and reconvene? Yep, yeah, for a week. For a week? Yes. So, in September, do you have a second term with us for that? Councillor Moran? Councillor Moran? No, this is two. Those in favour? One, two, three. Ellen, for once, tried it. Oh, I'm too tired. I would like really to be here to do this, but it has been emotionally draining. And I think if some councillors, as Jesse suggests, are tired, that then the others should be sensitive to their to um, that and, and adjourn the meeting. And you can do it yourself. You don't have to ask his, his permission. I would like to be able to attend the meeting. We've been sitting here for quite a while. I need a motion. I'm told I need a motion, Councillor Moran. I can't Just adjourn this. Yeah, I'm following the governance and they're telling me that well, I need a motion. Oh, okay. So can I have those in favour of adjourning this meeting? Come on, those against? Those against? So we're going to continue. Sorry, it's been long. That's really great of you to think about the thing. Councillor um, Martin. Martin. Yeah, look, all right. I'm, I'm happy to continue, um, and it is important. I get that uh, the assets and infrastructure. Um, Everybody, can you please remain quiet while Councillor Martin is speaking, please? The the assets and infrastructure detail is important, um, and I am concerned that. The decisions which are being flagged by the administration are primarily the ones on pages 71 and 72, where they're asking us or letting us know that these projects are at risk um, and that uh, there will be a need to um, review these things. Now, I, I um, I would like to have the, the discussion in the context of change circumstances, with the, the whole of the, the infrastructure area really. Um, there is now, as a consequence of the decision of council tonight, $2.7 million to feed into um, our uh, infrastructure budget because the east-west bikeway is gone. Not only is it gone, uh, some costs associated, as the Prudential report observed, there's almost a million dollars a year in maintenance of that bikeway, which is now gone. Uh, there is another, yes, it's uh, 6.2.1 of, um, of the Prudential report. Um, and additionally, uh, the issue of lost revenue from parking is now out of the picture. So, what's that in the picture? Well, yeah, yeah, well, I didn't get the phone call. Um, but um, it, those are significant uh, changes, and I would like the administration to work through those and see how that affects the mix of the information that's being presented to us. It's a very substantial amount in terms of this budget. So if the administration would go away, massage it, come back, I think we can have a much more productive discussion. I'm happy to have it now, but it would be a much more productive discussion. Anyone else? Count, uh, Lord Mayor? Um, thank you. Um, I, I do agree, though, some of the figures that you're quoting weren't in the business plan and budget nor the long term because that was in the plan. Prudential report and we hadn't made those decisions. So things such as the loss from parking isn't in the forward plan. Mm -hmm. Things such as the, I don't know, I'm not even sure the annual maintenance was in the forward plan. 
was it? No. And so, um, and uh, I did actually ask the question earlier this afternoon, if, if the bike ways didn't go through, what happens to that money? So at the moment, as you are aware, we have a letter with the minister to ask whether that money can be repurposed. Yep. Um, if it is repurposed, I would imagine they're still looking for a 50-50 contribution from us. Sure. But so, so it might not disappear, but it's also to understand if it does, what does that mean? Correct. Yeah. And that, that's all I'm yeah. asking. Which is the same question I asked this afternoon, Councillor Martin, and I, I do understand that because I was trying to see whether, particularly as, you know, as we're looking at long-term financial plan, we know that any reduction in borrowings it now has Correct. a huge impact on our in you know, 10 years time yep. um, and therefore I was very keen to understand what that meant in terms yeah. of long-term financial plan. In terms of this business plan and budget though, we actually really have to, uh, the, there's a couple of big ones which um, was the, uh, the removal of the 5.2 million operational expenditure target. Um, uh, which, given that we've had a conversation about contestability around service provision uh, and a few other pieces of work that I know administration is going to bring in in the next month or no, in, in next month, um, that I do think we should still have a, an efficiency target within the organisation um, so that we can actually have a look at how um, what that service provision is and what. Um, we can be looking at. We're very good at not stopping doing anything. Um, as a council, we've been very good at adding millions of dollars to the budget each year and without actually reducing the expenditure. So we really need to have a look at um, what that target might be and, and what that impact is. I think, thank you again, Grace and, and Justin. It's a great piece of work and um, there's so much work going on in this budget. It's fantastic to see all of this information. Um, in terms of the questions that you were trying to get to us today, I'm not even sure where they were actually, um, which were right up the front. I've lost. Um, uh, Grace is driving. Grace is driving. Um, so, Yes. So I might have to come back on that one once I have a quick look at that question. Any other questions? Anything, any feedback in regards to the key questions there in front of you? No. Uh, Sorry, could I just ask um, on slide, uh, I'm not sure what slide this is actually, slide 15, I think, which is page um, 52, uh, there was a plus 18.4 million continuing from 2021. Uh, is that carry forward? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, it is. Yes. And do we know what those carry forwards are? Uh, yes, they were provided in the appendices of that in the um, reading pack. So uh, they recall. Would you be able to point me to the slide 34, or I don't know which are you looking at the reading pack? So 71, 72, or slide 34? Okay, thank you so much. Councillor Hyde. Sorry, I don't have any mics on. Um, uh, thank you for identifying that those were carry forwards. I'm really shocked to see that there's that quantum there. Um, uh, not least because I've been asking for a couple of weeks if we had any any, any ideas. So um, I'm glad it is in the pack now. Um, uh, I suppose I just want to get a better understanding of of um, why the administration took out the 5.2. It's sort of for me. It feels like I've gone. I've gone into state for work for a week and I come back and the budget's $50 million more in debt in year 10 and $5.2 million a year worse off. I feel I just looked away for a second um, and everything's gone to hell in a hand basket. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm just I'm just wondering if I can get a little bit more rationale um, around that because as I understood it, there was only sort of 1.5 million savings that was talked about at that meeting that I saw. 
Um, and I know that the 5.2 was not explicitly, but it was within the budget parameters motion that the council passed in December. So through you, presiding member, um, basically transparency. We didn't have any science behind that figure, so we had it, it's a balancing item, and it makes the budget look better from a bottom line perspective. But there's nothing there to actually substantiate what that figure was going to represent in terms of savings. Um, so we're not we're not saying we stop any of the programs. We're just saying let's deal with what the actual true position is on the bottom line so that people can actually see that and what we're buying. Um, Grace, Grace might want to add, add a little bit more to that. Thanks, Justin, through the chair. Um, the motion that was moved was um, the expenditure target of 193.6 million, including subsidiaries. If we left the 5.2 operational target, which wasn't a part of the motion in there, we would have still physically not achieved the motion that was moved. So the maths just doesn't add up. So at 198.966 that we've got in there as the um, expenditure target at the moment, actually it should actually be, we should actually be referencing the 204 because the expenditure target also included strategic project delivery. Um, we are well and truly more than $5.2 million off of that. So if you included a number to balance it, it'd still be the wrong number. Um, so it was better to be transparent around yeah. that for council to make the decisions to whether you want to put the same number back in or yeah. not. Which, 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 which I appreciate and I do appreciate the somewhat newfound um, digestibility of our books. Um, uh, that's really good, even if it is uh, scary. Um, I, I suppose, so I just want to clarify that because that 5.2 figure has been thrown around for probably a few months now. So was there no science behind that? Was it sort of just plucked out? Was it, was it you know, an X amount of, a, to, you know, an efficiency dividend organisation wide or was it work? Well, it's basically how you do through the chair, with the I was just going to say, it was based on, I, on my understanding, was the surplus approach. And once council didn't go with a surplus model, it then impacted that number. But Nicole, please. Yes, uh, through the chair. Thank you. Yes, it was based on the uh, 24th of November when we set through the three scenarios. One was deficit, break even, or surplus. Mm -hmm. It was still at that point a plug number. It was to then come back to council and work through how we would achieve that through reduction through um, service delivery. Uh, it was based on providing a surplus budget over the 10 years, which would trade us out of and, and ensure that we were able to fund our renewals, key renewals required in the outer years of yeah, and so, but just, but just to clarify, when we talk about it, it was linked to the surplus model, and it says lots of moving parts in that model, but um, it, it was an operating, uh, it was an operating uh, expense reduction, and it wasn't. Was was there any specific tether to like by raising taxes, we were somehow going to spend less in our operations? Was it was it just part of that mix? No, uh, through you, because uh, I remember it works. Doesn't work on me. Um, it, there wasn't any anything of that nature that was uh, tied to it. It was basically to look at those sort of things. So we've tested a number of the assumptions with the with the uh, departments as we firm up on numbers. This is always going to be a moving feast in terms of your bottom line. But when you fix it with those parameters, things have changed since that time. Aida, we talked about tonight, uh, and so it will change. And and even now, the the deficit is less because of the work that we've, we've done. So um, it, it, it will always change and, and we need to look at some of those bigger expenditure items. We've got some things that we want to look at, but it's going to take some time to unpack them with the with the uh, departments who are involved. Mm. Yeah, I, I suppose my feedback is that I'm not saying that 5.2 needs to be put in specifically, um, uh, but I am saying the upcoming budget should be a surplus budget, a modest surplus budget. And that will require you to find around $5 million in operating expenditure reductions. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've seen parts of our revenue recover substantially. Um, uh, we've, I know the organisation has pushed for efficiencies and what have you, and I'll be honest, what, what greatly disturbs me is that we have achieved $20 million in efficiencies and we are still delivering the same level of service um, uh, by and large. But, uh, I would say that the contestability work is very important, um, uh, and we need to we need to now be asking 
some of those questions about our services and what we're delivering. Um, uh, if I can just, I'm just curious, um, with with the reduction in the bikeways, where would that appear on on this? On the, if you just said you're not going to spend it, where would it? We're not going to borrow for it. Where would it? Where would it eventuate? Thanks, Councillor. Through the chair, um, the bikeways removal for this year wouldn't have much of an impact on that 4.8 at all um, because it was only anticipated that we'd borrow some of that money during this year and obviously it was half grant funded so the only impact you would you would get on that 4.8 maybe 100 grand which would be in interest and that's it um, the sort of forward impact is a little bit more in the outer years but it wouldn't affect this year's budget yeah and so the, well, the subsequent year i'm looking at that one it was only 200,000, I think, um, uh, because all we planned for in the plan was just really to account for the borrowings. There wasn't at this stage any additional maintenance or loss of revenue or anything like mm -hmm. that yet. So, because we don't, yeah, but you're, so you're, and you're borrow, so your borrowings will be lower as a result of not absolutely, yes. yes. The borrowings will be more, yeah. lower by three million dollars because of the grant funding. Oh, sorry, there's no borrowings, on that. but that's no, yes, I was going to say, so you wouldn't affect so that, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, yeah, I would just strongly encourage that we do need to push for more operational savings um, and I'll save some of my further feedback for the next section. Councillor Martin, uh, Lord Mayor. you were after Councillor Hyde, but I will move on to Lord Mayor if you would prefer. Yeah, uh, I do think that, um, um, I know we've had a look at it, but I wonder whether we need to have a look at some of the other levers that we have got, for instance, we have continued to freeze the rent in the dollar for seven years. We also have decided that we won't look at valuations. We've also decided we won't look any, uh, I mean, we have done a slight increase to fees and charges. We removed outdoor dining fees. Um, I don't think we can continue to cannibalise our budget for any of our revenues and then keep expecting the expenditure to go up. So I, I would um, strongly recommend that we have another look at our revenue uh, for the council um, and uh, and look at what that may provide us so that we can be back in the black within the ne the shortest period possible. Councillor Martin. Um, look, I, I, I disagree with that emphasis entirely. Um, we already have, uh, courtesy of Councillor Hyde, resolved that uh, our revenue should increase by 3% overall um, uh, based on um, uh, new developments as well as uh, additional income. Um, so, you know, that, in, that increase is already built in there. I, I, it's not actually. It's not. I thought it was. No, no, it's, no, not. no, no. it's not. If it was, we'd be, we'd be very happy. Be much <laughs> well, hang on, why, why is it not doing it? Because we're we're going to have a workshop on through the chair. Yeah. We're going to have a workshop on how we was yeah. talking about economic levers so we could make an environment where we, well, so that we could make an environment whereby we can see that right. new yeah. that growth that rate increase due to new development yeah. coming online. How we as a council could incentivise economic development yeah. within the city instead of just the one percent that we normally yeah. get each yeah. year through natural means. Yeah. Well, it, it's almost too generally, but anyway. Um, um, but look, in any case, I, I, you know, we are in this position, it is a terrible position to be in, but it, I, I, I don't get this striving um, to have a balanced budget or a surplus budget. It is what it is. Um, uh, and although the work that's being talked about in terms of contestability is important, I think in the end it comes down to making decisions primarily about infrastructure projects, not about services. Um, the infrastructure projects um, are the ones that people notice least. Um, reductions to services, yeah, no, that's true, that's true. If a, foot, if a footpath is not upgraded this year, but it's deferred to next year, it, it is a minor inconvenience. If your rubbish is only picked up every fortnight, that's a major inconvenience. And I know that's an exaggeration, but that was the intention. So, um, and my bias would be towards um, those um, uh, infrastructure projects uh, that involve uh, our businesses. And I'm thinking uh, particularly about uh, the, the works programs that are identified um, for um, car parks and the like, where they can be postponed. Uh, I'm happy to see that. And um, where none of that works, um, then we ought to start looking seriously about infrastructure projects that can wait 
um, and those necessarily might include footpaths, roadways, and the like. But uh, the, the preference, in my view, should or the buyer should always be towards the infrastructure projects, not the service reduction. Okay. All good? It's con concluded tonight. No, uh, no, no. I thought we were having an infrastructure. Oh, now. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'll just talk to you that and introduce Matt, if that's okay, councillors. Um, so, the, as I said, we've talked through the budget of the renewal of the 33.1 there. What Matt has, is about to show you is the um, interactive piece that we have in the new aesthetic program around where those works actually are. So we've given you the detailed list in the appendices in terms of, you know, description of where they are. Matt will run you through the aesthetic program to physically or geographically show you those. Thank you. Okay, so um, just running you quickly through this given uh, the time of the evening. Uh, basically what this is, a spatial representation of the Capital Works Program uh, in regard to uh, renewals. So you'll see a spatial um, a geographic um, distribution of all the projects um, across uh, the city. Um, what this is, is I suppose a graphical representation of all the uh, fantastic work that's been done in the aesthetic system, which I've just got to say is a whole lot more data that sits behind this. Uh, each asset is segmented, each asset is componentized, each asset component is then uh, assessed by condition, etc. We won't get into the detail of that tonight, um, but uh, basically what this uh, shows is that representation category by category. Um, the intent of this map is um, we're moving uh, into a plan you want to design you to construct a three type arrangement. That's all moving towards having a future focus on having a three year or five year rolling capital works program. Um, what aesthetic allows us to do is actually have. <laughs> <laughs> it allows us to uh, have that. that uh, uh, it allows us to have that five-year forward uh, projected look um, on what's coming down the pipeline. Um, what we can do simply on this here is we can uh, drill into, uh, as just suggested, we can go into the buildings. Sorry, it's running a little bit slow. So we can see from the buildings category out of the $20 million worth of renewal, here's the proposed works um, in a tabular form, here's the proposed budget for those. Total budget of that category is $5.5 million. Um, and spatially, this is where they're actually located for those works that are going to be undertaken. Uh, we can then swap into the curb and water table. You can see where those works are going to be undertaken 1.2 million. Uh, roads category, uh, again, uh, $3.4 million, and exactly what those works are that are being achieved. I suppose, from a level of service perspective, the current adopted asset management plans uh, state that we should intervene at a condition four or five. Um, so that's how the map has been built up. Uh, basically, we have adopted the principles um, of the recovery, uh, the recovery principle, excuse me, recovery principles of COVID, uh, looking at everything through a risk based um, lens. Uh, all of the projects that are identified in here are either a condition four or five, with some exceptions. Those exceptions uh, extend to obviously undertaking detailed design for next year's program, so we're ahead of going ready to deliver on the next year's program. Um, there's some urgent works uh, uh, associated in here. Obviously, uh, when we're at a asset sustainability ratio of 67%, what that means is we're actually not delivering on $10 million worth of renewals that was actually planned in the long-term financial plan based on the current asset management plans. When we do that, we introduce a whole heap of risk um, that comes with community expectation, political risk, uh, financial risk, um, when I say financial risk, the potential of um, not renewing an asset at the appropriate time comes with a potential five to one ratio uh, additional cost. So every year you sweat an asset, there's a potential to increase that cost of that asset to be renewed at a point in time. Another way to represent 
uh, I suppose, um, asset sustainability ratio of 67%, because we're currently meeting 67% of the community's expectation on dollar service. So um, that's just another way to, to consider that. Um, I won't go through too much detail. Basically, um, happy to uh, accept any questions around um, the uh, program, uh, how it works. Uh, but again, this is something that hopefully uh, in the future will be on a public facing documents so people that can, uh, can see actually what's uh, happening in and around uh, their streets, but obviously subject to budget uh, considerations. Sorry, members, I have to go, so I need someone else to sit in the chair. So, um, your men. Yeah. Everyone all okay with that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hmm? So just questions for Councillor Hyde. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I, what I'm wondering is, I know I asked this before, and I, I don't know if it's filtered through yet or if it's still in in train. But um, uh, I wanted to understand a bit more of um, how many, how what things are being renewed because they're about to fail, or because of a because of their they're a risk of to failure, or they're a risk to public safety. I wanted to understand a bit of that. Um, and it's just because when I look through and I think see things like. Um, Know, what was it? Million dollars on CCTV. You know, I don't understand where that came from. Government if, if if the CCTV fails, you know, no one's going to <coughs> touch wood. No one's going to die. Um, but the traffic controller boxes, um, uh, you know, and that and that sort of stuff. I, I wanted to get a bit of an understanding. Of, are we renewing that because Safeholds asked us to? Or uh, are we renewing that because DIT has asked us to? They want to plug some new fandangled thing into the traffic. I want to just want to get an understanding of what's what's risk of failure in this list. Uh, so I said, uh, majority of the uh, projects located on here are at condition four or five. So condition five means it's at end of life. Condition four is um, not in very good condition. Um, as I said, our intervention level has been uh, when it gets over three and moves into the four. I uh, would then intervene um, to meet the expectations of the community under the current levels of service. Um, what you're referring to here, um, there's a number of items that we pick out. Um, uh, it's, it's not a million dollars, it's a hundred thousand dollars in CCTV. Um, street lighting, um, the LED uh, rollout, um, majority of that's happening in sort of North Adelaide. There are bits and pieces that are happening right. through other parts of the city. Um, but if we take that as an example, um, all that um, section up in North Adelaide is coming to end of life. It's currently uh, at uh, condition five. Uh, the reasoning behind moving to LED is, uh, from an environmental perspective, uh, we can't do going through late vapor um, uh, assets anymore. We have to change the room there. It's only got a four-year life. We shift to LED, uh, ends up with a 20-year life. Um, the cost difference. Um, has a payback, a quick payback period through LED, through our uh, reduction uh, in energy costs. Um, and obviously taking on new technology um, helps um, with those cost reductions into the future. Uh, and it also is an offset against our city deal. Um, uh, and, uh, and, does, and, and so I suppose if, if, given they're in condition five, so are the lights failing or have they failed or so the, the lights are at end of life and are at risk of failure. Some of those are failing. We are just going in and doing maintenance and repair on those as they come, as they turn off. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when it's in a network, it's all installed at the same time. When we start to see re repetitious or failures, we know that that's coming to end of life and it's only going to be a matter of time before that street goes into darkness, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously has public risk. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, the CCTV I was looking at was under buildings. CCTV network renewal and compliance program. Um, just seems like a. So, so for, for example, what's brought, what's brought about a million dollars for, for that? Um, uh, so, that's uh, from my understanding, and without having the detail in front of me, it's to do with our BMS 
uh, system is coming to end of life, uh, which is basically the security uh, system for um, a lot of our network of our buildings. Uh, without that uh, electronic compartmentalisation being upgraded, uh, there's risk of um, black spots in our CCTV network and security of buildings. But no, sorry, sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt, sorry, through the chair. I just wanted to book in what Matt's saying. Um, we are attempting and we are managing a $2 billion infrastructure portfolio on behalf of council. And I think it's important to note that um, we are and have responded to council's direction around um, reducing our renewal spend um, from around the $30 million mark down to about $20 million. Um, and in doing so, we've had to apply that risk-based um, approach already. But I, I do understand the individual detail that you're seeking. Um, but I've got every confidence that um, although we're not running assets to failure, we are on. You know, we are running at fours and fives, and um, we are taking the view that um, anything that, that works its way into next year's program is there because it needs to be done. Um, and it's probably a position that we couldn't continue to take for a number of years, but we've certainly um, responded to council's feedback and taken that approach for next year. It just, uh, yeah, sorry, I know, I don't know you guys are the experts, but it just, you know, to see Anzac, I go down Anzac Highway every day and spending half a million dollars on it, it's, there are plenty of roads I would recommend you redo before that one, you know, and I'm not, look, I'm an end user, I'm not an engineer, but, you know, to, to see that on there just raises question marks and I, yeah, you do see the odd light out in the city, but you know, at the same time, do we need to spend three hundred thousand dollars renewing it with LEDs, which I actually get complaints about, not good feedback about. So, you know, though, though that's just the sort of feedback um, that I would give. And yeah, so the, the the traffic control stuff. Where did that come from? I'm just curious. Great. Uh, through the chair. So the traffic controller works is basically the components Computerisation electronics within the box. Um, yeah. As you would be aware, we've attempted system through um, the network. Obviously, we've moved a lot of infrastructure from copper to fibre. Um, this is the upgrade of the infrastructure to accommodate the new infrastructure uh, within those boxes. And obviously, it has future capacity for adding or add ons with third parties if they wanted to connect into yeah. the network. But at this point in time, that's necessary works in order for those um, traffic light systems to actually operate. I suppose the thing is I, you know, I'll get